All right, Immortalites, welcome to another round of the conversations. We have a repeat guest, three Pete, in fact. It's Pete Smithson from the Aussie English. If you wanted to check out his other episodes, it was uh, number 52 and 67. So it has been a little bit of a while since we last caught up. And Pete, I'm going to ask you right off the bat for... Um, I was tuning into one of your recent episodes and I heard about how you almost squished some turtles while you are laying asleep on a beach um and and they were sort of like crawling up around your ass as you are uh, and and were awoken by them so i was i was asking do you have any more funny biology stories of um of your days when you were more that was that was i suppose your primary passion and, and what you were working on the most well that was um so that was volunteer work that i was doing up and around Bundaberg, and that that specific story would have been heron island uh, when I was doing turtle counts on that island. So, we'd effectively been sent out there to uh, just each night do walks around the island. I think we had to do one at midnight and then one later on at like 4 a.m. just to count the number of sea turtles, the green sea turtles there that came up on the island and laid. And we would also be counting how many of the nests had um, erupted and, and all the hatchlings had come out. And so, yeah, that that story was effectively that I was wrecked one morning i think it was like 5 a.m the sun was coming up and i fell asleep in one of the um pits that the turtles create when they're digging a nest they kind of they come up they dig a hole um they kind of clear all the sand with their front flippers so they clear out this huge space that's probably about you know two square meters by two square meters and there's just you know all the sand is flicked everywhere else and they even dig through like sand dunes you know grass all the plant material they just clear it all away because they need to get the roots out of the way as well so that if they do lay their eggs there the hatchlings won't have the roots from um the whatever it is you know the the plant material in the dunes growing over the top of the hole and then locking them in there because they can get trapped and die so anyway i fell asleep they leave once they've dug the nest with their back flippers they dig this like chamber that's kind of it looks like a uh, an inverted light bulb and they um so they dig straight down and then they dig it out with their back legs and then they lay their eggs in there fill it in and then at the end they kind of use their front flippers again to sort of push all the sand over the top and fill it in and so by the end of it they usually have this sort of pit that's being created a few meters forward from where the actual nest is where they finally stop doing the digging with their front flippers and you can kind of just like line them because there's a sort of nice little pits in the sand and it's kind of warm as you'll know up in Queensland and this is Heron Island so yeah. this is probably what a few hours north of you in Brisbane um, anyway, I fell asleep there and then, yeah, when I woke up, I had, had hatchlings coming up through my um, my pants and like under my hands and everything because I think I'd, it was the morning and I disrupted, um, they hatched from a little, that little ball, that kind of light bulb thing and then wait below the surface all at the same time, about a hundred of them. And then they're waiting for, I think, a temperature change in the sand so that it's hopefully evening or something. But if you accidentally disturb them, when they're there and one of them suddenly comes out, the rest will just take off and you have all of them just rush you. and it's like and rush. in the front lines. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that they <laughs> they all, um, yeah, it's like that. Like they all go at once and hopefully safety in numbers, right? The sharks and everything will pick off only a few and the seagulls and the crabs will only get a few. But yeah, so that happened. Um, uh, another so story were you would... expecting? Were you expecting them? <laughs> no. Did you know that there was turtles there? Like, oh that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it... I mean, I mean, I knew that there were turtles on the island and everything, obviously, and that there were nests around. But I'd never expected to really put my hand into one or something whilst I was resting and have it just erupt <laughs> below me. Um, I, I wasn't expecting that. The chances of that, I mean, you know, it's a pretty small island, and there are quite a lot of nests all over the place, especially by the the second part of the season, you know, the, the start of the year. So I think this would have been like February. So it's the end of the summer sort of season when all more and more nests uh, are hatching. Whereas if you'd come in, say, like November or December, they've only just been laid. And so they won't typically, you won't have very many nests um, hatching with all those hatchlings coming out. But at the end of the season, they're just popping out everywhere. Um, but one of the craziest experiences I think I had turtle-wise was going to Rain Island, which is even further north. I think this is, we went to Cairns and then it's like a two-day boat trip north of Cairns and you can only go to Rain Island if you're a scientist um, and you have a permit to, to go there and this is one of those islands that's um, a hot spot for green sea turtles where for whatever reason, it's just, it's, it's a tiny island that you could walk around in about, 
I don't know, probably 20 minutes. You know, it's like oh, literally wow. a few yeah. hundred meters long and there's no, there's no trees on it. There's a little castle kind of, um, kind of like a mini lighthouse with no light. I think that there might be a light on the top, but it was like, it's like this, um, it's like a rook from chess that's just sitting on one end of it that you can kind of climb up and have a look through. That's only probably about 10 or 20 meters high. But the whole island is effectively just sand and then there's like a little bit of vegetation in the middle of the island that's like ankle level where some of the the bird species nest and everything. And I think they used to mine um, bird poo there uh, years back, you know, back in the 1800s. Um, Anyway, so we got to go there and there's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of sea turtles that come and nest there on this tiny island. Like it's, you know, a few hundred meters in in circumference and you it was just it was it was fucked up when we got there and we got to go snorkeling and it was like being in finding nemo you know when they're in that um the the channel whatever it is the current the eastern current that they're yeah yeah and there's just sea turtles everywhere i remember swimming around and there would be hundreds upon hundreds of green sea turtles you know the size of a human just floating around in the water off the island waiting for nighttime to be able to come up on the island and lay their eggs. And that was just surreal. Like <laughs> It was just so weird being in the water and having this many turtles around. The other thing that was sort of fucked up was the fact that there were a lot of predators around because there are so many of those turtles. So you would have um, tiger sharks, you know, three or four meter tiger sharks just swimming around. <laughs> I remember the, we got in the water and they had like... Two of the guys that I was with had these big, long uh, wooden sticks. And I was like, what, what, what are you doing with that? What are you like, you know, going to try prodding some of the turtles or something? And he was like, I'm using these to keep the sharks away. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> so, that was a, and an eye And you still get in the water. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> well, and he was like, they, they should be fine. They won't come after us because there's dead turtles everywhere. But because you had, I think there would be tens and tens of thousands, if not 100,000 turtles in the water waiting at any time and every single night you would have i think at the time we were there and it wasn't like a record season but we had probably seven to eight thousand turtles coming up every night onto the beach and so what we would have to do is come out there at sunset and we would do i think we had to do two laps of the island at different times during the night or it may have just been once but effectively you had maybe three or four people um at about 10 to 15 meters apart lined up from the the water's edge all the way up to the sand dunes and you would all walk next to one another around the entire island one time counting all of the turtles to your left you know or or right whatever it was so that you then had an accurate estimate of how many turtles were on the island at that time when you did a single walk around the island and you would have to paint them so you would use you would use this kind of like um paint that lasted maybe a day or two and you would paint the turtles so that you wouldn't count them twice so it's like a spray paint kind of thing but it just comes off in the water after a day or two so the funny thing was too after a few days you see all these turtles swimming around that have these white lines on their back (laughs) because they've all been marked um but yeah Yeah, i remember that that was just insane because you just had so many turtles and you would trip over them and it was it was it was dangerous at times too because so, because you got so many of them, they get like flipped over, and then if they get stuck on the sand during the day, they they get they die. You know, they heat up and die, and then the next round of turtles comes up um, the next day and just kind of like half buries them, and so you end up with all these turtles that have have died and are just rotting, but uh, sort of just below the sand level, and. You, A few times I put my foot through the carapace of of a a sea turtle that was just putrefying and you had to be so careful because obviously we were so far away from a hospital or anything that if you you got a scratch or something or like, you know, a serious injury from the turtle bones that were pretty jagged and all over the place because so many turtles were coming up, um, you you could get infections really badly. So, you you had to kind of be really careful. But a few times I remember just stepping through the stepping on sand that I thought was solid and it just going, you know, sinking down a foot and a half into the the carapace of a rotting dead sea turtle (laughs) that had been there for a week or so. Yeah, and just feeling that that sort of like warm goo around my foot and just being like, this is fucked. This is fucked. (laughs) And then smelling it and just being like, I 
I want to die. This is awful. But that was really cool going there to that island and doing that. And apparently I, I think I went there probably like before Christmas. So I didn't see any nests erupting on that island at the time. So it makes me think it was probably uh, before Christmas or so early in the season. But apparently when you go there late in the season, so like February, March, every single evening <clears throat> the sand just turns black with all the, the hatchlings that come up, like hundreds of thousands of them just burst up if it's a really busy season with loads of turtles laying laying uh, nests because you, you got to think about it. You've got like 100,000 turtles in the water if it's a record season. And so you have like 10% of that population coming up on a nightly basis to uh, lay eggs because they so effectively – Turtles will lay multiple times. I think they they lay several times, maybe even up to six times in a season when they're laying eggs and then they'll go away for a few years and then come back again and do the same thing. And so it's like they lay their eggs, then they wait like a week or two to be able to create the next batch of eggs, you know, 100 eggs or so. And then they come back up on the beach, lay those, go back into the water, wait another two weeks, come back up, lay again. And so at any one time when all those turtles are in the water, you've got only about 10%, maybe a bit less every single night coming up on the beach to lay. And then they go back in the water and wait to develop the next set of... Um, wait of, their turn. <laughs> yeah, of eggs. But so you have, you know, thousands of these turtles coming up on a nightly basis digging nests, laying thousands of, uh, of eggs, right? So individual turtles are laying about 100, 130 eggs each. So you're going to have hundreds of thousands of eggs um, laid on a regular basis and they end up digging up each other's nests and disturbing other hatchlings. It's just in, it's carnage, like, because there's just no room on this island. It's tiny. But eventually, it pretty much every single space that is available is taken by a nest and then in the at the end of the season, they all start hatching. And apparently, yeah, if you go there uh, in the late season, you, you will just see every single night that just nest after nest after nest after nest just bursts through and all these hatchlings are just running into the water. And so I think that would be an insane sight if you were like there during sunset in the water <clears throat> and, you know, late season, all these these birds are coming, uh, birds, um, all these little uh, turtles are coming up and there are birds eating them, there are sharks there and it's just insanity in the water with how many there are. I think it would just be insane. But that was a pretty cool experience doing that. Um, For sure. Yeah. I mean, you sort of have to go out of your way to find those things as well, hey, because uh, um, the some of the craziest stuff I saw you know, kind of animal wise was in uh, Puerto Escondido in Mexico, which was sort of the very Southern part of Mexico. And I just went on a random little trip on a, on a boat uh, with some other people from the hostel I was in and we caught a Marlin um, <laughs> just, just kind of like <laughs> off the, off, like it was a proper boat with a proper, you know, big ass fishing hook to, to catch them. Mm -hmm. um, but that thing was, that was the first time I'd ever seen a, a big fish and I <laughs> was just like, whoa, that is, that is insane. Uh, there was all those, um, you know, just like in the movies when the dolphins are sort of jumping in and out of the water and, yeah. and kind of like doing it next to you, following along with you. Jeez. They were doing that, you know, they were only 20 meters away and then there were tiny little ones as well, you know, a meter long, maybe you'd go in the water and you could just hear them, you know, chattering that kind of screeching e -e 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 mm -hmm. un under the water. It was so so cool and you know i look it, it, it was out of the way for me but it wasn't even that out of the way in terms of you know all i had to do was just ask for a hostel trip <laughs> you know that was advertised in the hostel but um there's all there was all sorts of things like you'd just come across some random stuff of you know a sloth just climbing in a in a park in in colombia <laughs> you're just chilling out watching this thing slowly moving across from tree to tree that'd be nuts seeing a sloth in real life I, haven't, I didn't realize how sharp their teeth were. They have like canines that are just insane. They look like some kind oh, of Oh, really? Vampire. Okay, yeah. yeah. It was up in the tree, so I didn't get to uh, go up and <laughs> no, I was chase watching, it around um, or anything. Uh, you won't know, I don't think, but I was watching a TV show called Blippi and it's my um, it's like my son's obsessed with it. It's this um, American dude. Is it who, like the dolphin version of Bluey or something? <laughs> uh, he sort of, it's, it's just like a, 
a guy about our age running around doing stuff with trucks and going to zoos and showing kids things effectively how they work and then you know showing this is the color and blah 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 but he um he did one where he went to a zoo and they had a bunch of sloths that were they had like a I don't know if it was like a trellis or a pole set up for the sloths to just kind of chill out and then he was giving them grapes and I, just seeing their mouths open you just like holy shit like they <laughs> They've got some serious teeth. I didn't. I didn't realize they would be so. Um, yeah, I guess they have to be able to defend themselves <laughs> if, because they're sort of you know low hanging fruit, pun intended, <laughs> for yeah, a lot for of sure. predators. But they have yeah insane canines, like baboon kind of thing, happening. Yeah. Do you miss any of the um the biology stuff? Do you have any any thoughts of uh I don't know incorporating that into your life more? Uh well yeah this sort of leads on to the um plants right. <laughs> <laughs> that we were chatting about yeah. uh, kind of went nuts with indoor plants yeah 100 percent. i miss i miss just being around animals i think and learning about them and hearing the stories because i i studied uh at university to be a scientist and um studied i ended up specializing in evolution so i was always just really interested in those stories of how things evolved and how they adapted certain to certain areas how they ended up with certain adaptations certain traits that they had especially ones that you know, that are just really weird things like, you know, the story of how the peacock got its tail or, you know, those, those birds that dance. Yeah, in, um, the, that, that's what and came everything. to mind for me. Yeah. yeah, so learning those sorts of stories is just amazing. I, I watched um, Prehistoric Planet. I think that's David Attenborough's newest show. I don't know if it's out on Apple. You can find it online. But that was amazing because it was effectively the most detailed documentary about dinosaur behavior and biology that we have based on the science and so a lot of it was speculative but it was sort of based on either the science that they had and that they could directly say or had evidence for certain behaviors and traits um, with dinosaurs uh, from the fossil record and everything or that they had taken certain you know, not artistic, maybe biological license from similar systems, similar organisms that are alive today that we know have certain traits and sort of put them onto um, dinosaurs to suggest perhaps this is how certain species, uh, you know, hunted together or interacted. And, And it was just really, it's a really, really cool show if you've ever thought about how dinosaurs actually behaved and interacted within uh, their species so with one another but then as well um, with uh, other species of dinosaurs or um, you know the reptiles that were around at the time so they had some really good scenes in there of like um, is it the sauropods the the huge ones with long necks the um, like uh, brontosaurus and everything or uh, I'm not an expert with the names, but the, those massive ones with long necks and, and showing them actually how they would potentially fight with one another and taking that inspiration from giraffes using their necks and their heads to kind of line up and then try and knock each other out by bashing one another um, with their necks. And so it was showing that perhaps they would interact the same way, right, that they would congregate in a certain area like, um, say, elephant seals all coming to the same area and then the large males are the things fighting for their right to be able to mate with the females that are around and watching, you know. And so it was just a really good doco to sort of get the get the mind thinking about these sorts of stories and interactions and these um, traits and behaviours that dinosaurs would have had because they were around for, you know, 150 million years and had insane diversity and unfortunately we know very little about how they actually interacted on a daily basis which is a massive shame but you as a result you sort of forget no they actually did they would have had all of these really complicated behaviors and they would have migrated from place to place they would have had you know incredible displays they would have had different coloration different feathers different adaptive traits that they would have used for certain you know hunting purposes and all all these this complexity that we always seem to sort of have lost when you watch movies like say Jurassic Park right the original one which is an amazing film but it's just kind of naked dinosaurs with no real colors to them <laughs> just kind of yeah that, eating, was, eat, that was just humans. the the awe of just something really big you know <laughs> yeah exactly so this was a really cool tv show there were some other ones where they had like um 
velociraptors hunting um, pterosaurs. So they had like a colony of pterosaurs, right? Those are uh, winged reptiles like pterodactyl um, that were living on a certain cliff edge. And then they had these um, velociraptors or similar species to velociraptors that had effectively paired up together and were trying to sort of like go above where the the birds were perched and then come down on them kind of and they take you could see if you're a biologist or you knew a lot of sort of biological stuff you could see oh, okay they've taken these traits from um, snow leopards hunting on cliffs you know or they've taken this idea from I don't know leopard seals or something and they've you know sort of said, well, these dinosaurs and these other reptiles would have filled the same niches and lived in the same environments. So they probably had this kind of behavior in order to predate upon one another. And so it was just really cool kind of seeing that. And then thinking about things like the frozen areas of the planet at the time, right? So the poles and that there would have been dinosaurs that had adapted to be able to live in icy environments like that, which is something you just don't think about, right? You don't think a dinosaur yeah, living... Yeah you know, in Antarctica or the equivalent back then where it was all frozen. But those niches would have been there for millions of millions of years. So there would have been plenty of time for dinosaurs and other animals to adapt to live there. Um, so, yeah, it was just really, really cool. And then they had like those, um, you know, those dinosaurs or no, they would have been large reptiles that were in the water that had really long necks. Again, I, f- I always forget these names. I-, I know them if I hear them, but the ones that had really long necks and were carnivorous, um, these huge reptiles with kind of like kind of like a turtle and a giraffe put together but like carnivorous and they had they found fossils where they had large pebbles in their stomachs so they obviously go somewhere where they can get river stones eat these stones and they use those to help digest and crush up food that they're eating and so they showed yeah, okay. a family of these dinosaurs migrating I would have guessed to, just kidney stones <laughs> yeah no well they migrate to a certain area where there is a river coming out into the ocean and then the parents are showing the the um, you know offspring how to choose certain rocks and which ones to eat and then they go off and do their thing again and you're kind of like, that's really cool. Again, it's something you just don't really think about, um, you know, but there would have been all of this sort of complexity and, and these interesting stories. So I found it a really good show, Prehistoric Planet. Yeah, what's your feel for how much of it uh, especially the behavior stuff was you know, accurate in the sense that if you did get someone and, and, and put them back there, this would actually be it. Because I, I saw this thing, really funny thing recently, which was <clears throat> medieval portrayals of animals. So it was obviously people who had gone to Africa in let's just say the 15th, 13th century, something like that, come back, told all their mates about, oh yeah, there's this thing, it's a giraffe, you know, yeah. it, and it's, and obviously there's no photographs. If they're not a good portrait sketcher or anything like that, they won't have had any anything. So it's just imagine trying to describe to someone a completely new animal and <laughs> their depictions of giraffes, lions, elephants are just out of, like they're so, so ridiculous that you think, man, this is, you know, a, a, a three-year-old could draw a better giraffe than this, but obviously ne- never having seen it before, mm-hmm. you know, how would you describe it? Long animal with long legs, uh, a huge neck, um, two little pointy stumps on the top with a elongated face or something, and then <laughs> create something from that. Um, so obviously humans aren't, aren't that great at um, uh, that sort of second or third order, you know, it's Chinese, like Chinese whispers type of thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so what is, what does you feel like? Cause I, I could, um, I always, I always have this, which is, you know, I could come up with probably, uh, a whole bunch of implausible sort of scenarios. You know, maybe they just accidentally ate the rocks, <laughs> you know, maybe it wasn't strategic and they were just, you know, accidentally mistook it for a turtle I've, or that or sort a, of thing. I think we know is true because we, we already know of so many other organisms today that eat rocks intentionally in order to like gizzard stones, right. In, in some of these large birds, I think even chickens do it. And uh, the other thing with the, the fossils is that it just repeatedly turns up that you find, fossils of these dinosaurs that have those those same size stones in their stomachs so i think that sort of stuff it's 100 percent effectively that we know yeah. that that that's almost dead certain like the it's occam's razor where it would be so unlikely that you would end up with river stones 
in just lying on top of a dinosaur fossil over the stomach um, when it's found under the ocean somewhere and repeatedly happening for it to just be chance, <laughs> then yeah, they're yeah. actually going to a specific location and doing that as a behavior to help them. So I think that sort of stuff, that's the good thing. I mean, it's one of these, you watch Prehistoric Planet and it's any of these individual stories is probably not true. Like, or it's probably, um, I mean, you know, there are those sort of ones with the rocks, you know, but then they have ones with like, say, the large brontosauruses with these huge um, air bladders on their necks doing a display. And it's like, that is almost certainly not going to be exactly how it was or e- even potentially what that species did. But I think it's it's an educated guess and it's sort of like, a this is not something that would be out of place if you were to go back and look at dinosaurs, you would see some kind of display. They would have some kind of display. They would have coloration. They would have air sacs. They would have some kind of way of displaying to the opposite sex um, that they are, you know, the largest male, that they are um, an adult, and to also show to other males, you know, don't fuck with me. So it, it is one of those things and it just, you know, from animal biology when you go through and learn about all this stuff and just seeing these same things happen all the time in different systems these same sort of behavioral traits evolve these same sorts of adaptations coloration um, some way of protecting you from the sun's rays or some way of staying warm whether it's a feather whether it's a hair whether it's a thick skin they're going to have some kind of mechanism to deal with these things and so whilst when you watch a TV show like this, obviously every single thing has to be kind of taken with a grain of salt in terms of it being absolutely true. Um, you, If you were to be transported back, you know, 60 or 100 million years to see these dinosaurs, it would almost certainly be the case that there would be an insane diversity of, of behaviours, of, um, you know, physiology, of, of colour differences between them of and and things that aren't foreign. You would see them doing things that animals do today, right? Whether it's something like a peacock's tail with insane coloration that seems like it's totally useless biologically, but, you know, it's, its reason is to effectively attract the opposite sex, um, you know, and, and be a massive burden to the individual that has to carry that tail to show that that individual is incredibly fit you would see those same kinds of things in in dinosaurs, in all the animals back then. It wouldn't have just been something that, you know, only today have we finally evolved all of these um, behaviours because they can evolve incredibly rapidly. So I think, I think, yeah, it is one of those things where when you watch these shows, you think, oh, th- how could they know that? It definitely couldn't be the case. And it's one of those things where, yeah, in this this exact example is probably not how it was. But it's meant to give you an idea of if you were to go back there and look at how all these species were existing and interacting and, and you know, living with one another and everything, you would be seeing these kinds of traits, right? They would be hunting certain ways. They would be using camouflage. They would be using certain behaviors. They would be communicating. They would have calls. You know, there would be all this kind of interesting complexity that we often don't think about um, because it's so difficult to really know exactly what it was like for any individual species back then yeah it's kind of the the general um, idea is sound even if the individual isn't there's a couple of books like that uh thinking fast and slow by daniel kahneman which is Mm. about um sort of behavioral economics kind of and the system one versus system two you know when you first encounter something usually it's the kind of instinctual good or bad kind of gut feeling type thing happens. And then you have to really try and engage the rational thinking. And he gives a bunch of examples of this and each one of them. Yeah. If you drill down on it, that, that study was probably disproven or that, that one individual thing might not exactly be what's going on, but you know, when you have a 500 page book or however long it was just filled one after the other with all of them, you're like, okay, yeah, it's probably in the whole it's, it's okay. Well, and there's a really good book I read a while back called The Zoologist's Guide to the Galaxy. So, okay. uh, this is so by... Play in the Douglas Adams. Yeah, it's based on that, but it's, his name is um, Arik Kirschenbaum. And it effectively talks about what we can learn from biology here on Earth and kind of 
extrapolate out for biology and the rest of um, the universe, what it would be like if you were to land on a planet and there be biological life there, right? So organic life, um, what could we effectively assume we would see there? And whilst you would never be able to say there would definitely be this organism um, with this exact coloration, this exact traits, it there are all these things that we see in biology here in, on Earth, you know, that, that has repeatedly happened or repeatedly evolved that you can pretty much say for certain would be elsewhere in the universe, right? So, like, if you landed on another planet and they said, okay, it's going to be it's going to be a planet just like Earth and there's life there. You would be able to say almost certainly there's going to be stuff living in the water that's going to have different ways of moving around, different ways of being buoyant. There's going to be predators. There's going to be prey. There's going to be things that can harvest the sun's light for energy that will be at the bottom of the food chain and then there will be a food chain built upon that, right? There'll be some kind of organism at the bottom that can get energy externally and turn that into nutrients and food for itself and then it's food for everything else there'll be things that fly there'll be things that climb there'll be you know you can't necessarily say there's going to be things living on the um on the land that that have chlorophyll that can photosynthesize you know like plants like the one that i have behind me but you can safely say there would be something there that would have a way of say harnessing the sun's energy to turn that into energy for itself that would be at the bottom of the food chain. And there would be a diversity of that sort of, you know, biological life across the entire planet there um, that would be interacting with heaps of other species. And so, you know, there would be things like it, it, sexual reproduction of some kind where you have two different sorts of individuals that have, um, you know, two sets of DNA and they come together to um, have their DNA merge effectively and create diversity that way in the next generation. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of a book by, I can't remember it. I read this when I was really young, probably like 12, 13. Uh, it was by Carl Sagan, and it was him imagining what species would be like on other planets. So, and not just uh, carbon based as well, but perhaps silica based and how you might have these you know giant floating type things in the in the clouds yeah. of jupiter and how they would feed on i don't know sulfuric gas or, or something like that um <clears throat> so there was yeah there's a it's, it's funny seeing that blend between science and then it gets into you know imagination and uh picking out i guess how much to take from it as as being hmm, interesting and worthwhile and how much is just uh, okay you know this is fun <laughs> yeah well, it's one of those things i always find really fascinating to think about you know and and to break down life on earth and what are these things that would be common anywhere right like you know motion being able to move you may not necessarily have a wing that's built from feathers but we see on earth that there are so many different organisms that have evolved flight i'm not sure how many times it's evolved um independently but it's at least like, you know, say three, for example, you have it in bats, you have it in birds, you have it in insects, at least. And so, you know that because that's clearly something that different organisms have repeatedly evolved independently on Earth, and it's a problem that they faced where there's a niche of space in the air that they want to capitalize upon because it's incredibly beneficial. It's almost certain that that's going to be the same case anywhere else that has air and gravity, right? That there's going to be a a push for an organism to be able to utilize that to its advantage, whether it's to be able to hunt, to be able to escape, to be able to move locations rapidly, um, to be able to, you know, spread its offspring, everything like that. It, there, there's going to be some kind of way that organisms on, on another planet that has air, like say on Earth, it, that they're going to be able to utilize that in one way, shape or another, one form, shape or another. And it's the same with like legs, right? So you may not be able to say that on another planet that, organisms will definitely have two legs or four legs or six legs. The basic idea is though they're going to have some kind of way on land, for example, of moving around. Um, so they will almost certainly have legs of some kind that allows them to effectively overcome friction um, with the surface of the planet so that they can move more rapidly from one location to another. So yeah, it is interesting when you think about those kinds of things of like what are the basic 
things that organisms have had to overcome that we would know would be the same problems uh, elsewhere on other planets. You know, how do, how do things get um, gases like oxygen um, and how do they get rid of uh, the excess sort of stuff they don't want, right? The gases that are bad or the liquids they don't want. So things are going to have to consume, they're going to have to breathe, they're going to have to be able to excrete or secrete things that they don't want. But if you try and get really specific, obviously that's where it gets into kind of fantasy where, you you know, are you going to have an organism that has three teeth, a long nose and um, reproduces asexually? It's kind of like, well, there's there's almost no chance that that's going to be the case anyway specifically. But when you get down to the sort of the core elements of what life um, needs in order to survive or, or commonly, you know, evolves, then we can say, you know, with certainty that, it's almost certain that you would see those sorts of things on other planets. But yeah, the more specific you get, the less likely it is. And it's the same with going back to dinosaurs, right? You would, these basic traits and these basic behaviors and everything are almost certainly there. Whether or not you could ever say that certain species definitely had certain behaviors in particular, it's really difficult to ever get enough evidence from the fossil record to be able to pin that down. Um, but because it's almost certain that some of them had it. It's really nice to have shows where they're kind of like, okay, here's this species and we're just going to say that it, that it had this certain trait to give you an idea of what this is what it would look like, this is how they would have interacted. You know, take it with a grain of salt, but this is the, the kind of artistic license that we're going to work with to give you an idea. And I think that, that again, is why I liked Prehistoric Planet so much was because you actually got to see it roll out in front of your face, right? In front of your eyes, you get to see, okay, so this is the basic idea. Whereas a lot of the time it's, it's not even really talked about in films or shown, right? A lot of the time in films or shows where there are dinosaurs, it's pretty much just, it's always, you know, humans getting chased by them. And that's about the, as deep as the um, behavioral interactions really get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Um, it's kind of an adjacent topic, but just because you were talking about uh, the different kinds of things that can can form and uh, you know taking up new space, I suppose when it's when it's created. Uh, are you much interested in you know human life expansion uh, for yourself as well, in particular, as in like because mm, uh, I know there's all the types of people trying to do anti aging stuff, um, and then I suppose there's also the adjacent topic of um, bio enhancements you know getting better eyes mm. you know adding adding on top of stuff like that do you find that stuff very interesting at all yeah definitely definitely like i love sci-fi and those like altered carbon have you seen that tv show where they have these i've heard of it chip I haven't sort seen of it, things it, they have these kind of chip again assuming that i'm remembering this right because i watch quite a few of these different shows but they have these kind of like plates that are embedded in their necks between vertebrae and they are like computer uh, software that allows them to effectively uh, store their consciousness. So if they die and that stays intact, they can just sort of insert that back into another human body and bam, the person's, you know, back again. So they can change race, they can change gender or sex. They can okay, they can go yeah. back into the same body, assuming that they can, um, you know, clone that body and everything, but they, they're effectively uh, eternal as a result. And the show has this kind of interesting juxtaposition between the rich and the poor as a result, because obviously if you're mega rich, you can afford to have clones of yourself and, um, you know, an external system that, uploads your consciousness if you die and if that chip gets damaged or anything whereas the poor people might have the chip but if it gets shot or something and damaged then they can't come back they're dead so they still have that kind of mortality so it's it's an interesting show um sort of delving into that and and um yeah this kind of like what would you say deep future um fight between the rich and the poor, the class divide and um, what it means to be able to live forever. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to think about those things. And then I watched, what was it, Boba Fett recently where they had the androids, uh, the human android sort of things that were these, these guys, these oh, people. Man, this... Star Wars is, uh, yeah, it's adjacent to me. I don't, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Not a fan. Follow that stuff was, too much. No. Nah. It was, Boba Fett was pretty average, to be honest. I, li- I kind of liked it, but uh, it was a bit weird. But they had this kind of group of people who effectively kind of enhanced themselves, sort of like um, an underground group that would like, say, tattoo one another today. These people instead would take parts from robots and then insert it into themselves. 
So that would end up with, say, like a bionic eye or some, you know, super strength in their arms or something because they've taken robot arms and like surgically uh, implanted them into themselves. And that sort of thing is really interesting to think about how that'll change, how that'll go. You know, it's almost certain that we're going to be doing that sort of stuff more and more and more and more into the future. And so I'm always thinking about, you know, what happens with AI and biological life you know your human life do we end up like and, and robots do we end up merging together and end and and becoming this kind of well cyborg kind of fusion between the two where ai robotics and biological life kind of fuses together do you end up with these things separated where you know people will see humans as being this kind of like thing that shouldn't be adulterated by machinery but we need machines to be able to survive um, to be able to do certain things. So we may add things on, but we won't necessarily insert chips into our brain or anything like that. Or, um, you know, will one take over the other? Will you end up with an AI that ends up so intelligent? I've heard Sam Harris talk about this, right, where he says if you keep making iterations to AI, eventually it gets to the point where the AI can make the iterations better than you can. And then it's a it just takes off, right? So you'll end up with within a week, the AI gets to a point where it can do effectively a million years worth of iterations to itself in the blink of an eye and it just takes off. And so I think that's, you know, the singularity, right? Is that where they talk about that, where it's just, it's become its own thing and it just um, takes over and you wonder what's going to happen when, when we create an AI that can improve itself, what does it sort of, if assuming that it has some kind of a consciousness and I guess it'll have its own, its own needs, its own concerns, its own desires, whatever they are, whether that means turning everything into paper clips or, um, you know, protecting humans, or is it going to end up just only wanting to improve upon itself at, at the expense of everything else in the universe? You know, I, I, those sorts of questions I find inherently fascinating. Um, but I, I think we always underestimate how close those sorts of things are. You know, people always want to say that that stuff's right around the corner. <laughs> But I feel like, yeah, and and yeah. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, perhaps it is right. Like you know, there were people speaking um, uh, languages that we could understand hundreds of years ago, right? Like, which seems like a, a massively long period of time. You you know, like I can, I've read books from people from the 1600s, and you're like, that seems like it's it might as well be 2,000 years ago. Um, and I can understand what they're saying in, say, you know, English. But in reality, it's the blink of an eye. And so when people do say that AI hey, might be here in, you know, say a few hundred years to, to you and me, that seems like it might as well be a million years from now. But in reality, it's actually just, you know, our great-grandchildren great or something that are going to be facing uh, those issues. The same with climate change. So, yeah, I don't know. I find it inherently interesting. What about you? Yeah, I, I go through phases. Um, I, I find the ideas around it related to it. Like you're saying, what, what would happen if, you know, only certain people and the super rich could live for an extra 50 years? How would that change society? You know, would they alter their behavior and things like that? Um, but then when it, it comes to like the actual practice implementation of a bunch of these things, um, I find it so tedious, <laughs> especially if it's like on a personal level. So, you know, uh, you know, you could take these, um, these, uh, like statins, for example, have been proven to do something and, um, you know, take these vitamins cause they, you know, op optimizing for your like individual health. <clears throat> Whenever I've, I've done like even little bits of that, sorry. <clears throat> Whenever I've had little bits and pieces of that, uh, I've, I've personally just been like, uh, there's, there's too much effort. Like, <laughs> and I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing results. Damn it. Like, <laughs> uh, I want to, uh, it's, it's also something about spending too much time on, you know, living in the future rather than the now. And, uh, I, I personally prefer, uh, I've, I've just found that I, I like to go more into the, the now sort of area and, and focus a bit more on, you know, achieving some things now. Um, you know, spending more time with the family, things like that, rather than really focusing too far on the future. But I go on through phases. I, I, I'll sort of like mm. get interested for a bit and then I'll, and I'll dip back into more grounded reality, I suppose. 
Well, it's a balance, right? I, I read a lot of history books as well. And yeah, it is interesting. You could get lost in the past pretty easily too, like you could in the future and, you know, put things on a pedestal and be thinking about how amazing they used to be and be wanting to dive into those worlds more and more and more and just sort of at the expense of the present. Um, Without realizing now is definitely the best time to be alive ever, <laughs> period. I have, yeah, I've got a lot of friends who do that, right? Like, so they'll read about the past and they kind of romanticize it quite a bit and think it was so amazing. And then we'll say that, you know, today is a shit house and just really hard in order to live. And I'm like, mate, you know, my parents died into, I uh, dived into our um, ancestry and you wouldn't want to be a lot of the people that, you know, that were my ancestors, you know, they lived in the same place in England for their entire lives. They died at the age of 50 from some fucked up disease from mining or um, they spent their entire life putting scissors together, you know, so, and, and, and that was all they had. They didn't have the options of just pursuing whatever they wanted, getting access to information um, on online for free, being able to travel, access to clean water, access to electricity, access to healthcare, access to all of these things that we take for granted today. So I, I do find that sort of thing interesting when I have um, friends or family complaining about how hard life is today. And that's not to belittle the difficulties that we face today, but I, I guess when they say that, you know, oh man, living a hunter-gatherer life in the past would have been amazing or, you know, living in Roman times would have been so, it would have been so cool to, you know, live as a, an ancient Greek person and you're kind of like, I, I don't think it would. <laughs> I think it probably would have been pretty <laughs> shit house, to be honest. I think, I think we romanticize it. We read about all the cool sides of it, you know, and think, wow, this is what it used to be like, how cool. But you don't really get to... No one records the daily grind of just average shithouse life, you know, that, that they would have experienced, um, the diseases they would have had, the, the problems they would have had. The, the Yeah, it, I feel like putting that sort of stuff, the past in particular on a pedestal and, and saying that the present is just such a massive problem, it's kind of like you're, it's a bit myopic. You're only focusing on the negative today and the positive from yesterday and um, not balancing it. <laughs> <laughs> fairly yeah. another but an, it is another good example hard, right? of this is uh yeah going going to another country and you, you'll sort of go there and you know, basically anywhere you go you can find the positives really quickly because you're, mm -hmm. you're looking for the, like this new stuff and it's like wow you know yeah in colombia everything's so cheap wow everything you know there's the people are, you know they're really friendly and they you know they know how to dance amazingly and like look at these cobblestone um, streets that they have in, you know, some of these northern towns, which are from colonial times and things like this. Uh, <laughs> and then you spend, if you spend more than, you know, a month or a couple of months there, then you start to see the downsides of like, oh, if I leave my shoes outside, they're going to get stolen. <laughs> you know, yeah. the, uh, the trying to get any sort of paperwork done for anything. Oh man, that is just, nightmarish you know it's it, if you, you want to try to and get bribe a, them. you know the well this is where it's um you know i i didn't personally have to do anything like that because um i actually got kind of lucky i was uh so to go to colombia for example you can get a three month just tourist visa and i i booked my flight out almost bang on the three months yeah um not really thinking like, <laughs> oh, flights can get delayed. <laughs> mm. You know, things can happen. And your uh, visa's so I think out, I running it. out. Yeah. And so I think I booked it for maybe with two days to spare. Uh, and yeah, sure enough, my flight got canceled um, sort of like last minute to to go to Peru. <laughs> uh, and then it was just, um, it, was a, it was actually a connecting flight because I needed to go from, I think, Medellin to Bogota and then Bogota to, to um, Lima. And then it was just like, oh man, if I have to try and get an extension here, like, I don't know what's going to happen. Like, will customs let me through if I just, if I'm one day over, you know, how, how much time am I going to have to spend and money to, to fix what is, you know, essentially a, a kind of minor problem. Now, look, maybe this is the same in Australia as well. I haven't had to do it, but, um, <laughs> yeah, 
you, it's e- it's easy to romanticize about wow like the women here are better the food here is better you know everyone's so friendly and then you spend some time more living in the in that place and then the the downsides crop up pretty quickly there must be a name for that right where i don't, I don't want to say fetishize but romanticize the foreign the different the the you know yeah the 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 alien what you, what you feel is is so unique and 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 different you you put on a pedestal and think about how amazing it is and you sort of almost turn a blind eye to the negatives of it um i feel like i did that a bit in indonesia when i went there but at the same time i think i was also pretty aware of how it was not somewhere that i would want to live long term for obvious reasons um it was a beautiful country and had the, uh, one of the things that astonished me when we went, I did some field work there in the forest, in the rainforest. <clears throat> we were categorizing the different animals and stuff that we could find in the, in the rainforest on Sulawesi, the, the K-shaped island in the middle. And I remember going to a small mountain village and like, you know, people lived in huts, the dogs had mange the water they drank wasn't clean it was out of a river and they were probably some of the happiest people i think i've ever met and i was just kind of like this is so fucked up <laughs> like to to think about the lack of of quality water of healthcare of, of education of everything that they have um and and that i take for granted is so fucked up but at the same time to see just how happy they were i remember seeing there were a bunch of these older guys that lived in the town and i i don't know if they were like the equivalent of someone who's retired or if you ever retire when you live somewhere like that but they were just always around and they didn't seem to be doing anything like working at least when i was there they would just be walking around and just you know um always wanting to chat and kind of in broken indonesian um learn from you and chat to you but they always seem to be so sort of jovial and happy and laughing and just joking around and I remember being like these guys are like the age of my dad and yet they're acting like children in a in a positive kind of way like that they were just happy go lucky joking around constantly just dudes and I was like this is just so cool that they are so happy all the time, at least from what I can see on the outside as a foreigner who's come into this, you know, location. Um, maybe they just show me a certain image, but everyone there, like from the children to the elderly, seem to always be so happy and um, despite not having much, right? And so that always blew my mind because you, I don't imagine seeing the same kind of thing in Australia. If you were to go to a small town somewhere, Although people in a small town in Australia are probably on average, again, I don't have evidence for this, but probably on average a little happier and nicer than, say, some the same group in a big city. I, I can't imagine sort of encountering the same kind of people on a regular basis like that, just walking around and, and you know, uh, being that happy despite not having much. It's almost like the more you have, the more you stress out about what you don't have. And, um, you know, it, it was just really interesting. I don't know if they were like incredibly free as a result because they weren't thinking, you know, oh, fuck, I've got to pay for my kids' tuition at the local university or I, I can't afford to pay for my next um, Foxtel bill or my car, my, my neighbor's got a bigger car than me. How am I going to be able to buy another car so I look like I've got more money than they are? Like it just, maybe they're just free of all of those kinds of stresses. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I remember that being something I noticed and was just like, this is just nuts. <laughs> But then there'll be the other side of it yeah, where my dad commented. Oh, sorry, you go. Um, it, pretty recently, the <clears throat> I think the locus of control or like locus of happiness, whether it's internal or external, um, in more the Western culture, it's it's external. You know, the new car, the new girlfriend, yeah. the thing that you can have, the achievement on your wall, the you know, degree, whatever it is. And then the Eastern one is sort of more internal and it's being able to find that happiness, um, kind of despite the, the lack of external stuff or, you know, they still have goals and they can still achieve things for sure. But it's, it's just like that, that focus is kind of different, I guess. Um, yeah. And I think a a blend of those two is, is pretty good. It's, It's kind of useful to have. Yeah, I always wonder what indigenous 
Australians, for example, what their relationships would have been like, what their days would have been like. Because they would have been, it would have been so foreign, right? Like so alien to modern, um, quote unquote, you know, civilized human beings who live in cities and everything like that um, to be living off the land with a small group of people that you are always with effectively, right? Like you are, (laughs) you wake up with them, you eat with them, you hunt with them, you probably have sex in front of them, you probably shit in front of them. You are always with this same very small group of people, whether you're Australian, whether you're from, you know, say anyone from about 10,000 years ago back would have been living in very, very small groups of the same people all the time. And you wonder what it would have been like in terms of the depth of friendships that you would have created, how much deeper would your relationships have gotten as a result of being around the same group of people for say 50 years. Um, Whereas today it's like, it's incredibly rare for me to still be seeing on a regular basis, someone that I was friends with in high school, right? Only, I don't know, what's that? 17, 16 years ago. Um, I probably only cross paths with people I went to high school once every month, maybe. And it would probably be two people that I see on that kind of monthly basis. Um, I may talk to more people on Facebook, but I, I can't imagine. And, and it's the same with cousins or grandparents, right? How often do you see your grandparents or your cousins or your uncles and aunties? I probably see mine a handful of times a year, if that um, each individual. Yeah, well, mine are all in um, either New Zealand or Newcastle. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> it's even even harder for me. Yeah. But but imagine living in in a a single house, effectively, with all of those human beings um, for effectively the entirety of their lives and your life. And I wonder what your relationships would be like. Would you end up, you know, having these connections that are sort of even deeper than our best friendships today um, with with multiple family members um, or would you end up hating people <laughs> more than you hate anyone mm. today because you just can't escape from these human beings at any time. You're just like, God, that guy's always here. He's always here but our survival depends on it. I can't just like, you know, <laughs> just get rid of this guy. I can't leave because <laughs> I'm, you know, I, I live in yeah, a jungle. Yeah. I'm fucked if I go out on my own. <laughs> Or um, what would happen to, you know, someone with, let's just say like Einstein level, IQ level, yet they they don't really have the opportunity to, to use it. You know, what would they do? Would they try and externally invent and create and do things like that? Or would there just be this kind of real rich inner world that they create for themselves because that's all they've got? You know, they don't have mm. the ability to, you know, even write down stuff. It's It's just... Well, I think that, that, that would, would have been the, well. the limiting Or would they just be filter. viewed as crazy? <laughs> yeah. yeah, would they get kicked out? <laughs> I think, I th- yeah, it would be interesting to know, like if you were able to ever do experiments like that, right? Find a whole bunch of humans that have Einstein level IQ and raise them illiterate <laughs> and, and, you know, say like isolated in a, in a group somewhere, like an indigenous <laughs> group and they can't, they can't learn to to read or write and they have to only use what's around them as resources. It would be interesting to see, like, how do these guys entertain themselves? Does the IQ that they have manifest, um, you know, in any obvious way or do they just live life like a normal, you know, um, hunter-gatherer person and you, you have no real sign of them being hyper-intelligent besides, um, you know, being able to hunt really well or being able to organize social interactions incredibly well? Um it, it would be interesting because you would imagine those people existed and people much smarter than Einstein all over the place. And there's probably the same today, right? There are probably, say, you know, Indigenous communities in Australia that have incredibly hyper-intelligent individuals living in them um, that as a result of their environment never get to flourish. You know, they, they don't get to go to um, expensive schools or um, get encouraged by their peers or their families to pursue things like, you know, education or let alone say physics. <laughs> so I, I think that's probably the tragic, the tragic aspect to human human life. Like there's probably so many people, us included, that just never reach their full potential because of the environment that they're in and the things that they never experience. But you would have to hope, I guess, the the at a population level, the more we kind of, you know, advance in our societies, 
the fewer of those sorts of people fall through the cracks and miss out on opportunities. At least, um, you know, we have a higher proportion of people living up to as close to their full pro- potential as possible on a regular basis, somewhere like Australia, um, compared to, well, compared to even Australia 200 years ago, where you would imagine that life would have been completely different for the average European living here, let alone the average Indigenous person. But yeah, I always think about those sorts of things of, you know, who was the first person to invent the bow and arrow? Um, were they hyper intelligent or did something just sort of click? You know, were they, were they just playing with a string and a piece of wood and we're just like, hey, look, I can flick this other piece of wood quite a distance with this. How cool is that? And it didn't necessarily require an insane IQ. And then all of a sudden people noticed and it just caught on. Is it that sort of thing that happens where it's just by chance kids are fucking around with some instruments that they find, you know, some sticks and stuff and they come up with an idea and then all of a sudden someone else sees it and is like, oh, we can work on that. You know, is it kind of like a cumulative intelligence over generations or is there just some hyper intelligent individual like Einstein who just sits down one day and is like, okay, so previously we just had spears. But now I have designed this insane contraption where effectively we just take, you know, the sinew from a dead cat and we put it over this um, bit of willow and we bend it, get the right tension on it and we create an arrow with some duck feathers and put some flint on the end and now we can fuck up any mammoth that comes anywhere. (laughs) You know, like I doubt, I would really doubt it would have ever happened like that where you would have a single Einstein individual that had insane hair and the entire village was like, okay, this guy does nothing but just come up with ideas. Everyone else go into the forest and find food and, and our entire existence now is to just make sure that this guy survives as long as possible and comes up with ideas. You know, I, I, I don't yeah, think yeah. that that sort of thing would have ever happened. Um, I think... Well, my favourite one is the putting um, wheels on luggage, on suitcases, <laughs> you know, for such a long time people just lugged it around by hand and you had porters and you know all all that sort of stuff and then you know it took until i mean maybe it there was a reason for that maybe it was because airports were kind of you know cobblestone and they mm-hmm. didn't have smooth floors and and so there was no you know not as much reason for it because there just wasn't enough paved roads in the world but yeah i, th- I think that was kind of like a low hanging fruit that was around for quite a while and just you know, took someone just one day to go, oh, yeah. <laughs> Have you thought about this? <laughs> this is probably yeah. a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I know those sorts of things. And, and then the other thing was like maybe it has it was around for a while and, and just people would view pe- other people doing it and it just wasn't cool. It's like, oh, you know, look at this weird person like dragging their luggage around. Like why would you want to drag it on the ground even though it has wheels? Like it's much better for it to, you know, stay off of the ground. <laughs> yeah. Well, it- it's one of these interesting things like gun, guns, germs, and steel. I think it's sort of been debunked slightly, but the idea is kind of cool where, you know, throughout our history as humans, there have been certain things in certain locations around the world that have given rise to, say, agriculture or to gunpowder and everything. And you <clears throat> you need you need to have certain resources there in the first place to even be able to come up with or domesticate an animal, to come up with a certain idea or a certain invention or to be able to smelt a certain metal, right? You can't really you can't really create a gun if there's no iron <clears throat> where where you live and you can't, you know, create any kind of forge or metal metal work in the first place. Um, so I, I find that all also really interesting to think about that because that, that sort of argument comes up a lot or that, that discussion of why didn't Indigenous people in Australia come up with, a, you know, um, the wheel or, or why didn't they have some kind of domesticated animal that they could use to farm or why didn't they domesticate grass or something? And you kind of like when you look at it, those things aren't required in order to reproduce as humans and survive. And so ultimately, Indigenous Australians didn't really give a shit about maximising, you know, their their private property or um, the amount of, uh, I don't know, yeah, stuff that they could have and and technological advancement. What they were concerned with was surviving and raising their children and, and allowing them to survive into the next generation. And ultimately, if you can do that with, you know, uh, some rudimentary, um, weapons and, and instruments and you you can do it just fine, then there's no real need pushing you. And and if there's – and if you don't have certain things in the area as well, right, like I don't think in Australia we really had any animals that were 
domesticable. Um, you, you know, you can't really domesticate hopping marsupials and, and turn them into farm working animals very easily, if, if at all, I don't think, you know, so whereas by chance, uh, Eurasia had certain animals that you could domesticate pretty easily, like horses and, and cows and everything, and then use as farm animals and, and for transport. So I, I find those sorts of um, topics really interesting to think about. Uh, yeah. It's probably because they had it made, man. You know, just sitting out, chilling under a tree. So uh, <laughs> that's well, life. That was the <laughs> interesting thing. Large. You read a lot about the hist- <laughs> you you read a lot of historical accounts in early co- colonial life here in Australia, and a lot of the Europeans think that Indigenous people are lazy. And the the funny thing is, it's kind of like behaviorally, com- if you were to just directly compare them to what you consider. Um, to be, say, not lazy, you know, like having a job and, and, and working and building and, and, you know, doing everything that early colonists were doing back then, um, then, yeah, I guess you could say that they were lazy, but in reality, they were conserving calories, right? Why would they do more than they need to um, in order to survive? Why are they going to go out of their way to waste time, um, you know, say, trying to, to build a house when they don't live in a specific location permanently, uh, and the, they can survive perfectly well using the environment around them in order to find shelter and everything like that. So it, it, it's so it would be so cool also to sort of see what Indigenous people thought of Europeans when they first came. The problem is we just have very few accounts um, of those sorts of thoughts because I think, you know, the average Indigenous person didn't speak English and didn't, wasn't taught how to read or write, let alone had their um, thoughts valued or written down um to to pass on but that would have been so cool to know like you know whilst you had these europeans there looking at indigenous people as if they were aliens you know these these savages that lived off the land and and um you know they did they they can't be human like we're human it would have been so interesting to see what or to know what indigenous people thought of of europeans you know what they wore how they behaved um, the kinds of interactions that they had with people what they valued and being like you know you wonder if you just had the indigenous people constantly just scratching their heads being like what the fuck is with these these european dudes and um you know being obsessed with rum or carrying around these certain weapons or having this this what is with these clothes guys you can just go down to the beach and find a dead whale and and put the blubber on your skin and you'll stay warm all year round like why the fuck would you get a dead animal um, you know, take the hair from that dead animal, turn it into a fire. But like, that seems like so much effort to make some clothes. You can just skin a possum and put that on your back and you're sweet. Why would you bother with all that extra effort? You know, it would have been amazing to have been a fly on the wall to hear all these kinds of conversations going on um, throughout that period with early settlement in Australia and just both sides kind of scratching their heads at the other and being yeah, like, I empathize a lot with that. <laughs> After this, I'm literally going to go to South Bank here in Brisbane and just hang out with some friends. And, you know, I'll do some handstands, but <laughs> there's not a there's not a whole lot of stuff that's going on. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I haven't had you know a standard job for getting close on six years now. So uh, yeah, how does that I'm, feel? I'm, I'm, oh man, it's fucking fantastic. <laughs> 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 I mean. Uh, there was a small, a very small period where uh, I had had some doubts, and it, it it was kind of that. It was that man. I feel like I'm being lazy. Like, yeah, um, it was kind of you know ha- trying to explain to people like, uh, you know, I I don't really see the point in getting money to be able to then use that money to relax because I'm so tired after all the time I spent trying to get money. <laughs> you know, that was that was kind of my, my, my thought process and still is largely like if, if I don't need it, why 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 go after it, I suppose. Um and that's not to say I'm like not ambitious. Like I've I've still I still do a, a fair chunk of stuff, but it's just yeah, it's it's kind of not in the normal way, I guess. Um but I mean, you're you're kind of on this similar sort of thing in a way, which is <laughs> when was the last? Uh, if 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 podcasting is not considered a job, when was the uh, last you know job job that you had? I've never had a full time job to be honest. Yeah, I guess yeah, you know, besides studying, studying, I guess would kind of be yeah. Yeah, besides doing my PhD and having a scholarship to do that, and effectively you know quote unquote work full time, which I probably didn't. <laughs> 
Like I was, you know, <laughs> I, I definitely didn't do eight hours a day, five days a week of being at the museum studying for my PhD. Definitely did not happen, which is probably yep, yep. why it took me six years instead of three and a half or four years. Um, but <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It is one of those things where I think I'm sort of. Well, like you, it's a gift and a curse. You have to kind of be self-motivated to be able to make it work. And I think f- being, you know, I hate using this word, but entrepreneurial, it always sounds like you're just jerking yourself off when you talk about being an entrepreneur. I've, I've never used that word for myself and I don't think I ever will. <laughs> yeah, it's so annoying, right? But I guess the idea being that I, you know, make money by solving other people's problems and coming up with, you know, yeah, products that solve people's problems. Like my podcast, Aussie English, solves the problem of migrants coming to Australia and having trouble with the language, wanting to learn more about the culture and the history and everything like that. And that there isn't a out of the box kind of just do this, show up to this place, work this number of hours and we'll give you your paycheck um, for Aussie English. It's more, you have to be creative. You have to try and come up with um, solutions to people's you have to work out what, what are people's problems what are, you, what are these people having trouble with well, how can I actually give people value and it's kind of an honest it's kind of a pretty brutally honest job in that sense because you're not going to make money unless you are helping people <laughs> like you can't really just show up and create a podcast and get paid but no one's listening you know you kind of have to yeah. you have to be creating something that people are getting value from one way or another um, so yeah it, but but it's it's good and it's bad in that you I'm I I don't feel like it's a job. I kind of feel like I'm just dicking around most of the time. Like I I feel like I'm just having fun when I come up with ideas. I create podcast episodes or courses or videos for YouTube. It doesn't feel like a job. And part of that is probably that I don't have a boss being like here's your set of orders for the week. Um you know, complete this. Have you hit your target de- deadlines and all this other stuff? It doesn't feel like I'm sort of ticking boxes or um, reporting to someone else all the time and, you know, it becomes laborious as a result. But on the other side, I kind of, you know, sometimes spend a week not doing anything or like recently I've probably been working at about 25% capacity for the last four months just because I've become more of a stay-at-home dad. My kids have been sick constantly. I've been sick constantly and so I, I kind of can't do anywhere near as much as I would like to. Uh, but at the, the same time, it's kind of like you're. I've been able to earn the same amount of money effectively because I've done all this past work that's put everything into place uh, and I get to have all this sort of free time. So, yeah, it is, it's pretty foreign to think about having a nine-to-five job for me at the moment considering that I never really ever had a full-time contract nine-to-five job. Um, so, yeah, but at the same time, I kind of... And I don't know if I'm romanticizing those sorts of jobs, but I kind of wish that I did have a job like that because you can just turn off, you know, at least I imagine that you can just go to work, do your work, go home and not think about it or at least not have to report to anyone. Whereas like when you're a quote unquote self-employed business entrepreneur, whatever you want to call it, it's kind of always on your mind and there's no sort of discrete time where you're kind of like, here, I'm just turning off now. You know, it's five o'clock, here's my time slot i'm done i'm not thinking about work until tomorrow morning at nine it just never turns off and i think the other part is the social aspect that i would really like um i remember doing my phd at the museum and i loved being able to come in every morning seeing six other students that i was studying with in the same office and all of us going and getting coffee and hanging out and you know shooting the breeze talking shit about um, dinosaurs or about rats or about someone's you know current project issues and being all in the same place, even having the same enemies at work, you know, like my um, supervisor was a bit of a dragon and we'd always just bitch about that person. And you kind of, it's kind of funny where you no longer have, um, you, you no longer have like really close friends at your job and you no longer have enemies at your job. You kind of, <laughs> it feels like there's something kind of missing. You don't have people to sort of bond with and you don't have people to bitch about. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like that, <laughs> that social aspect of it. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, um, well, even mine, which was not the standard nine to five, it was kind of a nine day fortnight and, you know, working out at the mines, 95% male workforce, it's, 
it's still different enough um, that, you know, we didn't go out for coffees, for example. You know, there's, yeah. there's literally nowhere to go out for a coffee <laughs> when you're out in the middle <laughs> of nowhere. Uh, uh, now, like some people got around this by, you know, it would, it would be regulars at the bar or whatnot. But when the, the last thing I wanted to do after after work was actually drink it was kind of like man i just mm-hmm. I, I need some alone time like i'll go to the gym i'll go to my you know little dong and, and spend time there um i think for some people the nine to five works but you have to have that ability to switch off um me personally i found it bleeding into into the weekends as well like mm-hmm. it, I'd, I'd just think about it i'd just be uh oh, you know what you know sh- shovel nine i wonder if they're gonna dig through that you know hard patch this this weekend like it <laughs> i didn't find that inherently interesting but it would just you'd, you'd already start to be planning for monday being like all right mm-hmm. i'm gonna have to do this on monday i'm gonna have to fix this up um and it depends on the type of work as well uh i i had to work on a weekly plan a lot of the time that was you know the weekly plan it's got to be done before thursday produced uh you know released on friday morning and s- you'd come in next Monday and the old one had already been screwed up enough that you were now fighting fires to then try and create the next one. <laughs> it was so repetitive. And yeah, there's uh, I think for some people it can work and, and for some jobs and situations, but not, not for me. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't think I can go back. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to imagine a way in, in which I could go back to that, that sort of, uh, type of lifestyle or routine again. It would it would be really hard. It would be really really hard. What do you see yourself doing then going forward as a full time job, <laughs> whatever so, hours that actually looks like? Yeah. So it's, it's it's kind of funny because the the thing that I spend the most time on nowadays is something I'm not sure I'd ever want to have a like money attached to it, which is handstanding. I, I spend mm-hmm. so much time doing that. It's probably close <laughs> to you know like five hours a day or something with all the stretching and uh, associated really? stuff with it. Jesus um, Christ. Yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I want to get to a level where I, I I've been saying like world-class, like yeah. just like such a good level. And I think I'm probably about halfway there in, in terms of, um, where I'm at at the moment. Uh, but, uh, for the podcast, so Juan and I have started doing something called value for value, which is essentially, uh, it's a really simple concept. It's so deceptively simple, which is, you know, sort of like you were saying, um, we provide value in, in a, a form through the podcast. And then we just ask for that in return. Now, how people want to do that for us, definitely it helps to the, like the monetary aspect. So sending in, um, I guess just support. So, um, the typical way people have done this in the past are things like Patreon, or buy me a coffee or um, like a subscription service through Apple and, and things like that. Uh, all of which take out huge chunks. I think mm-hmm. Apple is 30% yeah. of Patreon. Same I as think Patreon, is, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's big ones. Uh, one of the cool stuff with just, you know, inventions and technology is um, the people can do that right now within the podcasting app. So... If you're on one of the newer ones where you can, and this, this is where it starts to get <laughs> lots of things added on, but uh, you can actually, you know, take in a, a chunk of, of Bitcoin, um, put put it on your sort of podcasting app and then stream it to us. So for every minute that we you listen, you can, you know, stream in a, a small amount and you can choose mm-hmm. whatever amount you want. You know, we don't ask for, we, we just say like value it however you want. So if you're really enjoying it, you know, set it high. If you're not enjoying it so much, um, doesn't matter. And then that's the, the really cool thing with that is it is on me. You know, I have to make mm-hmm. something that's really entertaining. Um, I don't know if I'd ever go down sort of your route, which is a lot more solving a direct problem. Um, I'm, I'm probably more the kind of entertainment s- section, I guess. Uh, but we've been doing that for probably the past ooh, past past yearish, um, but really the past four or five months really hard. And um, yeah, I, th- I think it's it's definitely 
something where if we 10x to 100x our listenership mm -hmm. um that that would be sufficient for at least my lifestyle for sure i don't know Juan's kind of He's, he's, he's got his own job, so he doesn't, you know, <laughs> <laughs> he might need more, more, uh, to live off than I can, but, uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm certainly, uh, you know, minimalism combined with a, uh, not needing super huge amounts of money, um, would, would definitely make it possible in the long term. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the, the way that we do it, um, at the moment, which is what made you get along. into the handstanding stuff so hard? Cause it, <laughs> I guess I ask this because the older I get, the more I've, I try and work out and because of the entrepreneurial side that I have in my mind constantly working out, how do I make money from my time? Anytime I now come up with hobbies or ideas and we can talk about the plants if you want in a bit, I'm always thinking, how do I make yeah. money from this? How do I earn uh, another source of revenue from this just to keep it going and, and hopefully, um, you know, fund itself or hopefully have a bit extra uh, for my life as well on top of that. And so with the plants, for example, I'm into rare house plants now that I'm hoping to grow out and then you sell for hundreds, some of them thousands of dollars each and it allows you to pay for more to be able to expand that. Um, but I guess I'm asking this with the handstand thing in mind, you said you don't want to associate money with it. Um, but do you feel like a a kind of pressure there in in order to not associate money with it because you feel like it'd be corrupted or you don't want to be thinking about um your your hobby in a monetary kind of way like what what's the reasoning there because yeah i think if it were me i would be thinking how do i make money from this straight away so that i can keep doing five hours a day and not not <laughs> yeah, feel gotcha. like i was um wasting time on something that is and i don't mean this in a nasty kind of way but i mean it's sort of like um Oh, it's completely pointless. There's well, no, uh, yeah, no. I don't mean... Uh, well, there's a point to it, right? But I mean, I guess, um, you know, it would be like me taking up, um, what would you say, like uh, paper mache, you know, and getting hardcore into it, but not selling any of it, not doing any of it, you know, just do, getting into some really, really sort of abstract, abstract kind of hobby that was fun in and of itself, but had no real external use for anyone else. I would be constantly thinking, how do I make money from this so that I can justify doing it and spending all this time on this thing? Like that would that would be the thing that would be eating away at me. But you were saying you you intentionally don't want that to happen. So I guess I'm asking in a very long winded way, why is that the case? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you know, this could just be a kind of personality difference because uh, I've, I've never particularly had that. Um, even when I was in uni and, you know, picking a a subject to go down, um, you know, dad suggested engineering, um, that, that kind of made sense cause I was good at, you know, science and maths and physics. Mm -hmm. Uh, the reason I chose mining engineering was pretty much the only reason was because the, I, I'd met a guy and he showed me a 3d modeling program. I think it was Vulcan, but uh, I could be mistaken, but it was, it was kind of like 3d modeling of this mine that he was doing on his computer. And uh, he also showed me a really funny slideshow of mining accidents where it was just, you know, diggers and like huge tractors getting uh, caught up in machinery and like how the shit did that thing, you know, sort of like goats on the side of mountain, like how the shit did that thing get up there? Like, mm -hmm. well, that doesn't make sense. Uh, and, you know, then it, it paid, I knew it paid well. So that also, you know, mm -hmm. it, it had like a slight aspect to it. Um, Look, handstands are completely useless. There's, uh, I, I totally acknowledge in, you know, you know, 15 years time, 20 years time, I'm not going to be able to do them at uh, a high level. Like, you know, your body deteriorates over time. Uh, honestly, it's, I, I think it's refreshing to have some things which aren't associated with, with money. It's, it's kind of, um, and this is how I've always viewed the the podcast in a way as well, which was like, I didn't come into it expecting it to, to really be a lifestyle. It was kind of just like a, 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 a way to uh, fund a lifestyle. It was more like the lifestyle was there because mm -hmm. I enjoyed it. And then I'm kind of hoping that the funding can, <laughs> can sort of come uh, in the future. And look, but potentially maybe, you know, there's, there are people who, all they do is um, one guy I had on the podcast a long time ago, Miguel, Miguel Santana, who's insane. Just his, his, uh, his, that's kind of the level I want to get to in terms of 
you know, being able to one arm handstand, mm -hmm. um, do all these sorts of different shapes. And it's kind of like, you know, Cirque du Soleil level where he's at. Um, and the, you know, he, he makes his lifestyle by teaching people, you know, mm -hmm. they, they'll, he'll go to different gyms around the world. He's got his own sort of place in Brazil where people come in and, you know, spend at it. I'm not sure how much it is. I think it's in the thousands for, you know, a kind of week with him. Wow. Uh, there's, so there's, and then there's opportunities like, you know, entertainment, Cirque du Soleil, you could, you know, create an online course. This is how you do it. The sort That's, of thing. This is the stuff that I would be thinking about. I think yeah. it would be like, how do I make money from this, um, sport that I'm doing, uh, yeah. to, to, to at least justify the amount of time that I'm like treating it as if it were just a nine to five job where I'm getting say 25, $30 an hour equivalent of, of the time that I put into it. Yeah. So I think it's just a flipping. Like for me, mm -hmm. it's the, the thing first and then yeah. perhaps afterwards there's there's focus on that and that sort of stuff. Well, I think uh, that's where we're the same because that was the sort of thing with plants for me recently. I was sort of like, I want to fill the house with a bit more greenery. I want to be closer yeah. to nature. I miss biology. I want to do more of it. But then pretty quickly it became, how do I make money from this to be able to pay for this? <laughs> yeah. How do I justify the amount of time that I'm spending learning about plants um, doing the plant stuff, uh, having them in my house and everything because I could go down. It's kind of like how I see kids that game quite a lot. You see a lot of kids spending hundreds, if not thousands of hours playing a game. And then there are those certain kids who work out to, how to monetize that by starting a Twitch account or by, you know, getting into the sport heavily or by getting on YouTube. And you're kind of like, that's where, okay, now you would be a parent of that child and be like, okay, respect, you know, like you can put money in the bank and you've got a quote unquote job that's kind of like supporting you. Whereas if you were just someone who was like, I want to be on Centrelink so that I can fund my gaming habit that doesn't make me any money, you would have a di completely different um, kind of look at them as a parent, I think, right? You would be like, you're wasting your life. Whereas as soon as the, the kid's making enough to be able to, to get by, it's kind of like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think for me, it's also kind of the, it's, it's, I'm, I'm kind of, I've got a, like a little bit of hope in, in that my, my kind of general worldview is, uh, if you put enough time, energy, effort, and do it in a, a way that is, um, uh, geez, I, I guess pure in a sense mm -hmm. that those opportunities can come later. So it's, kind of, and, and then also for me, it's, um, you know, language learning, I, it doesn't cost anything. So I'm not worried about the outlay. Now for the yeah. podcast, it was a little bit different because, you know, buying cameras and mics and, uh, you know, uh, uh, hosting that, that sort of stuff, it does require some outlay and some sort of continual things like that. Um, but then, you know, I saved up a bunch from mining. So I kind of, I've, I've kind of got my nest egg just sitting there, which I can draw from. Um, and it's kind of keeping me <laughs> stable and level, um, which also is, is very helpful. So that's, that's like another, just a, like a, an additional aspect, which is I put in, you know, let's, let's just say the, the four years of uni plus three years actually working. So it's, let's just say seven years that, that kind of gave me a bit of a buffer for, you know, well, well, seven years, I guess. So I've got one more year and then I <laughs> got to get my shit in order. <laughs> Yeah, it, it is interesting. I guess to pointing it out, you were saying that, you know, handstands are pointless and I would argue that that's not the case because it would, there's so many, so much to it that could have a sort of indirect positive effect on your life to allow you to say make a living in the way that you enjoy making a living, right? If it's allowing you to stay fit and healthy, which keeps you in shape mentally and physically to be able to do the podcasting and everything else. It kind of does have yeah, a point, yeah. right? Like you know, status as well. There's, you know, I, yeah. I kind of get applauded. <laughs> People will randomly walk <laughs> by and, and just clap. Hey. And they're like, yeah, yeah, awesome. <laughs> so there, there's, there's, yeah, there is all, all those sort of things, but. You need to start putting out a hat when you're, when you're working out, just put I've the hat on the ground it, and be actually. like, the nation's welcome. <laughs> <laughs> See Street what happens, performances. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, look, uh, it's kind of, it's not tongue in cheek, but I, I do acknowledge like it's, it's one of those ones that maybe kind of appears, um, you know, what's, what's the point in this? You know, why, why are you doing this? Um, 
but mm-hmm. but you know that's that's kind of with everything i do to be honest like what's what's the point in learning german um which mm-hmm. i'm doing at the moment yeah there is a point I, I do intend to go to germany switzerland you know austria someday but uh it's it's kind of i don't know i'm kind of like the i i like the tim ferris or um talent stacking if you've heard of scott adams the guy who created dilbert which is you know mm-hmm. create get get good at instead of being you know top 0.1 percent in this thing get top top 10 percent in four kind of skills and if you you can kind of be strategic about it and and have ones which are generally applicable like public speaking maybe coding maybe um you know entertainment or something like that uh, i think it's a big part of just becoming an interesting human being right you don't have to necessarily be an expert, but to have different goals that you're pursuing in different areas, like, you know, that that old idea, I don't know if it was like a Victorian era idea of uh, what a woman should be, right, where she would be able to sing, she'd be able to have a conversation, a sophisticated conversation, she would be, you know, able to speak French and she would be able to play a musical instrument. And so the, the, the parents could then take her to... Um, parties with eligible young bachelors and she would be able to entertain and then marry off into hopefully a wealthy family. And it, I, I do kind of, you know, anytime you watch those old movies, right, all those movies about like, um, what is it called again? Pride and Prejudice. And you see that kind of stuff. I mean, it's a fictional story, but it's sort of based on the times and what life would have been like for the, the upper class um, back then. But I'm always thinking about that in like modern times of, who are the people I find interesting and why? And who are the people I don't find interesting and why? And a lot of the time, they don't need to be experts at anything in particular, although obviously that does help if you have an interest in the thing that they're an expert in. But if they just have multiple interests that they're pursuing and they have that general curiosity that's sort of pushing them, the curiosity, ambition and motivation that's kind of pushing them to learn about those different things, I think they become just inherently interesting people that you can interact with and chat to um, well, at least personally, because I have that personality to some degree. And so I think just seeing that, like you and I, I, I see that shared interest and, and pursuit of sort of excellence in areas, whether or not you actually become a pro or not isn't really the point. But the fact that you are, say, you know, pushing your limits with something like handstands, even though I, you know, haven't done a handstand in probably half a decade, um, the pursuit is what's interesting to me and it's fun to talk about with other people. So like with plants, the house plant thing is really funny because it's kind of I like... Was, I was going to ask, what's like the, what's the top echelon of plant, <laughs> house plants? <laughs> well, it's so, it's such a weird hobby and a, like it's a bit of a long story, but when I got into it, I totally felt like how I imagine women feel when they get into a very male dominated area because when I was getting on YouTube to try and learn about a lot of these plants and um, following a lot of these creators, they're all really young, attractive, creative women who are like fashion, um, you know, kind of interested in fashion or house design. And then if they're not, if they're men, they're incredibly camp gay men. Yeah, I was going to (laughs) say. And so I just totally felt like, wow, this is, I have no one who represents me as a demographic interested in this area. Like it took me, I mean, eventually you do find a few of these straight white men, for example, you know, who are interested in, in house plants, but they are few and far between. Um, so it was just a, it was a really interesting kind of, it, it was interesting to notice that um, because I think as, you know, a quote unquote cis white male, um, you are the majority in a lot of pursuits, a lot of areas, a lot of rooms. When you walk into a room, generally you're the majority, right? in one sense or another, and um, you take for granted what it's like for uh, minority groups who, uh, you know, feel like they're not represented in certain areas, like women complaining about not being represented in, um, I don't know, politics today. Um, My argument is always that most politicians are fuckwits, so that's probably why there aren't that many women who are... (laughs) politicians so you know but, i was gonna uh, say like the smartest thing is staying away from that shit <laughs> i know exactly yeah exactly so um what was i saying but yeah it was just a it was really interesting and then just being i have probably now spent hundreds of hours listening to young single women and um probably young very very camp gay men talk about plants 
and now they feel like my people. So it is really interesting. I actually have, there are several channels. One is like Hakuna La Planta. So it's like a take on Hakuna Matata. Nice, yeah. And he is this Canadian um, uh, of Asian descent, massively camp homosexual man. And he's probably in his mid twenties. And I just love his channel. I just can't get enough of it. And the guy is probably about as different from me as you could be. Uh, in terms of you know behavior, sexuality, everything, how he how he presents himself, um, but it's it's so funny how what felt foreign to me at the start is now like massively normalized. You know, and there's so, there's so many sort of things we could talk about here because that is kind of like that exposure to the the foreign that makes you suddenly see it as just normal now. Once you get enough exposure to it, it's like why people are racist, right? Because they don't they don't spend enough time with the people that they tend to have racist um, beliefs or attitudes towards. And then as soon as they've spent a significant amount of time with them, that, that tends to just disappear, right? Because those barriers mm. all disappear. So it feels like that to some extent. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, so getting into the plant stuff was really interesting because of that and just feeling like, holy shit, I don't feel, <laughs> I don't feel like anyone my age or my, my um, sexuality or anything is interested in this at all. At all. Did you dip your toes in or did you go full bore? So the photos you sent me that you've got like, I don't know, what, 30 or 40 or something like that in your house? More, <laughs> More than that, dude. <laughs> There'd be over 100. There'd be oh, over 100. Wow. I went hard. I went hard. I mean, initially I didn't, for the, but again, it depends on what you mean, right? If you were to zoom out and just look at the last four months, I've probably spent about $10,000 on plants. Um, <laughs> and they're, and they're, they're everywhere. They're in your kitchen. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds like a lot. Like it, to to sort of give you the context there, um, I had about ten thousand dollars in um, investments for those apps, right? So like I think it was Raise and the other one was Spaceship, and consistently over the last year they've just been losing money. Uh, like I think both of them have lost me about probably about a thousand dollars combined out of ten. So ten percent say across both. And so I, I kind of got to the point where I'm like, I could just buy some expensive plants and sit on them for a few months, grow them out, take some cuttings and sell those cuttings and cover my costs. And then if I hold those plants for another year, I could probably double or triple the amount of money I've spent on those plants, right? As long as you know what you're doing and you're not going to kill them, um, then you can probably you know, make a lot more than say the average of 8% back on your investment annually. So that was why I ended up dumping um, my investment money into uh, probably about 20 plants that are worth between $100 and $1,000 each and just with the plans of growing them out and then taking cuttings from them and then selling those via eBay or Facebook Marketplace or whatever to other people who are interested in those plants. And again, also trying to diversify where I have about six or seven different kinds of rare plants as opposed to the single type um, because the prices fluctuate greatly and all of a sudden it could be incredibly um, you know, ubiquitous everywhere and worth nothing. So I tried to diversify my portfolio <laughs> <laughs> that way. But um, yeah, so I, for the first few months, I bought a lot of cheap plants and um, just got used to how to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> slowly no i got used to taking propagations so like cutting them up getting them to root different methods um and then um then started diving into the more expensive ones and and trying to not kill those and uh yeah it kind of it ended up becoming a it's, it's really interesting like plant addiction i didn't realize was a real thing and i've never had any kind of addictive personality i don't think apart from maybe collecting things and i can kind of feel it coming out with the plant stuff because i went through a phase of buying stuff on ebay when i had this say ten thousand dollars to spend on plants and it gets very addictive very quickly um bidding on things purchasing things having things arrive in the mail um that that constant novelty it, it, it gets very addictive very quickly. And as soon as I tried to wean myself off, I found that relatively difficult. I found that pretty hard to suddenly stop and not keep purchasing at the rate that I was purchasing at <laughs> once my money was sort of all invested. Um, so that was that was an interesting thing to kind of experience because it does become like a you you begin to acquire things for the sake of acquiring them. And I didn't realize there are a lot of influencers who talk about this in the plant community. And I'm sure it's the same in any of these sorts of um, communities where people purchase things and collect them or, or whatever. 
Um, but it was a very interesting aspect to my personality too that I noticed that um, I'm like, it was... <laughs> It was actually really funny. My wife kept saying, I kept telling her about all of these plants that I was getting. And every time she would be like, do we have a problem here? <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, like, are you okay? Is everything all right? Like, we're okay financially. And I'm like, yeah, we're sweet. We're fine. And she's like, okay, well, I'm going to believe you. But um, if we have a problem, just tell me we have a problem. <laughs> and I remember, so I was very introspective about it and I haven't purchased anything for several weeks now. But um. Yeah, it was just a really interesting kind of adventure where I was like, oh, shit, okay, I guess this is one of those things where, you know, people will be like, I'm not addicted to, I've, I've tried heroin, I've tried cocaine, I've tried whatever, but I'm not addicted to any of these <laughs> drugs and then they try um, alcohol and all of a sudden their life's over, right? Um, so, yeah, I wonder if yeah. it was one of those things where I'm like, oh, shit, is plants what it what it's going to be for me? You know, that's going to send me bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be the, uh, and, and, uh, yeah, the other would be like, all right, the safeguard process, you know, if if we are unable to see light coming through our windows because the foliage is too dense, like that's that's maybe yeah. another warning sign. <laughs> oh man, it is it is a fun hobby though. I think I, I didn't realize like getting into it and watching a lot of these videos online initially, I was like, God, these people are so weird. Um, because originally <laughs> I just wanted to sort of green the house up a bit. And yeah, yeah. all these people were like doing house tours and they would be showing off all of their plants and which isn't weird in and of itself. The weird thing would be always like, oh my God, my Monstera has a new leaf coming through and it's so cute. Oh my God, it's so beautiful, so cute. And oh my God, my philodendron over here has a new leaf. Oh my God, isn't it the prettiest? That Like they would lose their shit over <laughs> new leaves coming through on their plants. And I remember thinking like, just calm your jets, like cool down. Jesus Christ, guys, it's just a fucking leaf. Um, and then a month later, I found myself doing exactly the same thing in front of a camera on my new plant channel. So, <laughs> <laughs> nice. but I, I think the, the, the point that I'm trying to get to is that like, you don't realize how meditative, calming, um, antidepressant, this kind of behavior is where on a regular basis, on a daily basis, you're checking on an organism that you're taking care of, sort of like a Tamagotchi in real life. That's sort of a lot slower than a cat or a dog in terms of the care needs but you get to see it go through changes. So, you get to see these l new leaves coming out, um, roots coming out that you, what you're doing in terms of light, water, fertilizing, humidity is, is um, helping the plant flourish. And you do get this kind of endorphin uh, rush each time that you see your plant is still surviving and doing really well. And when it's throwing out new leaves on a regular basis, you know, oh shit, I'm crushing it. I'm doing really well. I'm giving it the environment that it needs. Um, but uh, yeah, the reason I kind of wanted to talk about this was that I did also realize that this is one of those hobbies that you just shut the fuck up about unless someone asks you. Like you do not open with this as, as a hobby. Because <laughs> <laughs> so many people, their eyes just totally glaze over when you go. Yeah, I could imagine like, that. Yeah. I'm more into it. I even feel it at the moment. I'm almost, I'm almost like how hard do I actually sort of go down the rabbit hole here? So it's the first hobby I think I've had where I'm sort of somewhat ashamed of it <laughs> publicly. And I kind of, kind of keep to myself like it's hidden behind closed doors. So, I've had quite a few friends come over who haven't come over for a few months and they'll be like, oh my, you know, when they yeah, walk yeah. inside. Oh, whoa. Like, That's a very polite way of saying what the fuck. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It's funny, um, you know, enthusiasm and passion is... I think inherently, um, it kind of like attractive or interesting, but yeah, there is for certain topics, like it just doesn't carry over too much. Um, I, I I'm, I'd say handstands are kind of similar. If you, if you're chatting with someone and they, and you start getting into like the intricacies of, um, why a one arm handstand so difficult or, you know, like why this, this person doing this video is, is technically possible. Um, I was arguing with my dad the other day about, uh, there was one where it was essentially like a girl does the splits in a handstand and then another there's another girl sort of like just um, doing like an L sit on her. So her hands are on one of her legs, which is bending over. And it's sort of like, you know, imagine putting, let's just say she was a 60 kilo girl, a 60 kilo girl on, on her leg in the air. Super impressive. Um, and you know, I was arguing with him why this is possible and why the human body can withstand that, even though, you know, it requires you know, a decade of, of work to get up to that level. 
Uh, but you know, he was kind of interested at first and then I could see pretty quickly. He was like, Oh, okay. No, I don't need to know why, you know, yeah. the internal mechanics of this leg can withstand 60 kilos and, and why, well, and you know, her that's joints the hard were just part, right? working out. out where, where people's interests kind of wane off. But also a lot of the time I find that there are so many built in assumptions, uh, that the other person will know what you're talking about that you have to kind of be aware of and try and explain carefully. Like you have to become pretty good at explaining all these things that you may take as just um, common knowledge once you get deep into a, a certain area. Like I, I know all these different species names now and, and different genera in the plant world, but I think if I were to say something now that I hear on a regular basis to you, you would just be like, I have no idea what the fuck you're talking about. I can't picture that. I don't know what that is. And so you have to you have to kind of remember that. And I think that's the difficult part with plants. There are so many, um, they're so foreign to the average person that the average person's probably just going to be like, okay, that's just a cute plant, like sweet, next. Whereas, you know, with other hobbies, they may have a much deeper knowledge. The average person may have a much deeper knowledge of say cars, for example, um, than they would house plants. And so, yeah, it is one of these hobbies where I definitely just shut the fuck up about it. If I don't... Um, if I don't have to talk about it, I won't because I know how people are just straight away would just be like, oh, Jesus, you know, like stamp. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Jesus. But at the same time, I think any topic can be interesting if the person is passionate and and, and interested enough themselves and a good communicator, which yeah, you know, that, ironically that last take. bit is the, uh, yeah. Yeah. Is you, the have key. To, you have to spend a lot of time talking about it, ironically, to be able to become a good communicator. So that that's the trade off. But I think, you know, you could talk to someone about cleaning toilets and it could be interesting if the person was interesting and a good communicator and passionate about it. If they just showed an interest and a real sort of like, oh, the best part, you know, the the, the flushing dynamics of this toilet easily peel the poo off all surfaces in this toilet because of this, you know, physical, you would just be like, man, that's really interesting. I've never thought about that. (laughs) You know, whereas if if someone is just clearly... um, yeah, I, those those scenes that come up in movies where they talk about um, the specifics of banking or something, I'm always like, man, this stuff could be interesting, but the way in which this person is talking about it makes it just fucking boring as shit. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I feel like um, there's there's not many topics which I inherently find just boring and dumb. There's 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 only a couple I think that are really really like that, um, but yeah it's 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 more the one the the person who's actually presenting it and then i guess mm-hmm. like the the group the type of people so like you're saying there's there's lots of um you know young girls and camp <laughs> camp gay men uh the there is you know uh, there will be some barriers where it's like maybe it's the adjacent things that they start to t- talk about as well because you know it's kind of hard to focus just on plants and it gets kind of boring just focusing on one thing as well and then their associated hobbies might be um i don't know uh what what's there's like a real popular thing of like lipstick and makeups and and things like that like i imagine Mm -hmm. there's probably a little bit of crossover between plants and and that and yeah i'd I'd put the lipstick and makeup one in (laughs) category of like i'm not gonna find this interesting like there's no there's no real way you're gonna be able to convince me of this (laughs) Yeah, I I don't know. I feel like I could find it interesting because it's something, again, I just know nothing about. So, I think, but as it's kind of a dance, right? When you have conversations about these sorts of topics, you as the person talking to the the person who's sharing their hobby or whatever need to be interested. You you can't just kind of be shut off and, oh, okay. You need to be following up with interesting questions. You need to be digging in. Like, I think you can be inherently interested about anything. Um, You just have to dig in like if someone were to bring up makeup i would be like you know you would just start with what makes putting makeup on your face um like what's a shit job versus a really good job like how do you how do you determine what's good and what's bad um you know why do you use certain certain things around the eyes why is that important you would you know, how do you hide these features? You would just dig in and I, for me at least, as someone who's, I guess I do a lot of interviews, I get good at asking questions and just following my curiosity and I think if you're a good person, a good sort of curious person with any topic, you can kind of just keep 
asking interesting questions for your own sort of personal gratification where you're just like, I've never really thought about this. What do you do for this thing? Like if it was me coming in with plants, you'd be like, um, why the fuck are the most expensive plants some of the most ugliest plants? <laughs> like how does that work? Like why is anyone buying some of these plants that just look like shit that you would never have if they were $10 but because they're $1,000, everyone wants them. And you would be like, well, because they cost $1,000 and they're very few and far between. They're hard to propagate. People can't get them to root so that they're, um, you know, really difficult to actually send in the mail. And that, like you would go down those rabbit holes and be like, oh, fuck, I never thought about that. You know, that, that's, that's how people end up with this very, very specific kind of taste um, in a specific area because they go down these, these niche rabbit holes. Well, the same with like metal music and people li- listen to like some of the most full on music that like my dad can't handle some of the music that I listen to. Um, so like the heavy, heavy, heavy stuff like Meshuggah. I don't know if you know that band. No, but I, I'm not that big into it. It's just like all the Scandinavian bands, aren't they? This, the, uh... they're, they're Swedish and so they're only yeah. screaming, but the music is incredibly rhythmic and, and it has incredibly detailed mathematical kind of patterns in the rhythms that they use in the background. And so you can't really have melodic singing over the top. And so the only way for you to have a sort of voice over the top, unless the person was just rapping, which it wouldn't make much sense, is to have screaming um, type vocals. And so I'm always trying to show him how I find it interesting. And I do see his eyes glaze over, but I'm always like, so I'm, I try and explain, this is why people get into this kind of music. They're not going here looking for a Bruce Sp- Springsteen ballad and then, you know, get into the next the next minute, they're all of a sudden obsessed with screamo. Um, they're obviously interested in rhythms and, you know, the, the drumming or bass kind of thing. And then they go down this rabbit hole and they listen to heavier and heavier stuff and then eventually end up here. So, I don't know. It, it is always interesting trying to, trying to get someone who looks like they're not interested in something to find the interesting side of something. And that I yeah, feel like that's m- the challenge. Maybe the philosophy of makeup could be... <laughs> <laughs> or like the d- yeah. dating dynamics of makeup that that could maybe be up my alley but in, in terms of you know this is this pastel color versus <laughs> this yes. complements this <laughs> yeah. i think that would be where i would be going to i'd be like what do you think of the fact that by wearing more makeup and having more people wear makeup you're teaching younger people that they should look like this or need to look like this to be attractive you know what are the ethical problems that the same with like men who use steroids and i i have this issue with actors a lot of the time some of the biggest actors out there in big movies especially the certain australian superhero actor is almost definitely taking amounts of certain steroids in order to maintain his his physical attributes Um, and I'm always like, what is the ethics of him not openly admitting that or talking about it, which he probably signs a disclosure when he gets these movies saying that he's not going to talk any way, shape or form about anything illicit, um, when it comes to, uh, getting into shape for a superhero film, which is almost indefinitely required for everyone who's going to have a superhero body. But what are the ethics of doing that and being a hero to young boys? And and then getting on social media, like um, I remember I saw a post the other day from The Rock. So how old's The Rock? What is he like? Almost sixty years old. Is he? Jeez. And he's more dang. He's more ripped than he's ever been. Yeah, right. Yeah. A sixty-year-old man. Yep. He's probably got ten times as much testosterone as the average twenty-year-old. And you know how? And he put up a post saying, "Just train harder. Just eat chicken and rice. You know, you just work hard." <laughs> And you just like, you are so full of shit, dude. You know, like that's part of it, clearly. But the other part is copious amounts of both illicit and expensive supplements that you're probably getting from several trainers who are monitoring your blood work and everything like that. And so I remember getting into that and thinking about that recently and just being really sort of annoyed with the amount of those men in those areas who are definitely using things that they aren't admitting to using and influencing younger boys and pretending as if all that you need to do is just work harder and go to the gym and train when, you know, it would be like for women wearing a lot of makeup and having a lot of plastic surgery and just telling women they just need to, I don't know, go to the gym a little more and lose a little bit of weight to be prettier. You'd be like, 
uh, there's a little more to it, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Those, the, the, what is it like lie of omission versus, um, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was uh, talking with one about this the other day of, of sort of like following the money as well. Like I, I, I kind of like it when I know where someone is, is funding their lifestyle from just because then it's like, that's mm-hmm. a, I think that's a pretty vital piece of information. They don't have to be super explicit of like, I'm gaining, you know, X amount from this sponsorship and things like that. But just, just a general knowledge of it, um, you know, which is what we do. Like every... <laughs> we read out basically every single message of, of someone who has sent through a, a, like a, a it's called a boostergram, sort of like mm-hmm. a, a support payment. And it's all there. If you, if you want to, like you can go through all of our shows and you <laughs> tally it all up if you felt like it. Um, but if we're doing stuff on the side as well and, and not talking about it, that is where it'd be like, uh, no, I'm not the biggest, biggest fan of that. Yeah. I don't know. It is. It is one of those. That, it's one of the things that bugs me. I think the, especially where you're portraying something as obtainable, um, through just hard work, and there is a lot more below the surface that um, is going on. And in many cases, like this, with the acting and the these huge actors um, on illicit substances in order to maintain their physiques at like insane ages. Um, you're setting up, you know, children to effectively be disenfranchised with their own bodies and with their own results when in reality they should be, I think there should just be honesty about it. You know, if you want to look like a superhero, you almost certainly need to be on insane um, training regimens, probably unhealthy diet regimens. And then on top of all of that is going to be some kind of, you know, injections of illicit substances and probably legal ones as well that you you can purchase somewhere for insane amounts in order to maintain a body like that at 60 years old so it's always one of those things that irritates me because then you wonder how many boys end up going to the gym not getting those results and then being like well fuck it i'll just get on steroids and not taking care of their health the same way that people like that those actors are able to they just put in copious amounts get the results and then end up you know fucking them themselves up physically yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, the good thing is there is, uh, <laughs> there are lots of videos out there of people pointing this kind of stuff out, making fun of it mm-hmm. as well. Um, so it's, yeah, and it's the it's the broadcasting of it. I, I suppose like where, how much attention is going to which place. Generally, I think the truth comes out, but there is that lag and delay of, uh, and, and not not always as well. You know, some secrets stay hidden forever and um, aren't. It, it, it would be better for the world to know. There's kind of uh, actually just leading into the last thing I wanted to bring up, which was uh, I went down to Canberra recently to a, uh, a protest for... Uh, oh, a, that's so, right. So, you wanted to talk about this. Yeah. yeah. What was so, it? Sorry. So it was, uh, it was called Converge on Canberra and it was basically uh, organized to um, protest against uh, Julian Assange's extradition, which is mm-hmm. coming up. Uh, look, there was that was... I'm going to say maybe 20% of the reason of why I went. The other 80% was uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> external reasons for like, you know, spending time with my brother, catching up with a friend. Um, the re- like the reason it even occurred anyway was because uh, my dad had shown interest in, in doing it and he he kind of wanted to go, but it would have just been like really hard for him to to sort of like organize it and go down with my mom as well and things like that. So he sort of like offered to pay for me and my brother to go down as like his stand-ins, I guess. Like, mm. so it was kind of, you know, <laughs> 80, of that 20%, 80% of the reason I was at that particular one was because he uh, <laughs> was like, it was, it was doing it for him. You know, I, I, I kind of agree with the general principle of, of um, freedom of the press and things like that. But in terms of the Julian Assange case, I, I don't actually know too much in general of, <clears throat> everything that he like how much of the documents he leaked how much of it was done in a way that could have endangered lives and things like that like i'm i'm kind of yeah it does seem like one much. of those things where the us is just trying to make an example of him and charging him as like a a spy or whatever for treason right i think i yeah, heard yeah that i think it was espionage kind of like espionage, he's not yeah. even a us citizen and he wasn't in the us when this happened so how on earth do you 
how do you charge him with treason or espionage or whatever where he's overseas? You know, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, th- I think there was I, one I count think- of um, uh, gaining access to a uh, of a password of like password mm-hmm. hacking or something like that, which is a specific word for that. Um, but it's, it's one of those things that's so hard because. I find him to be just such a wanker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like a massive wanker um, who is just so, it feels like, you know, that that um, South Park meme of just sniffing your own farts constantly. <laughs> and I feel like he's just, he sees himself as the world's savior. Um, you know, he has this huge narcissistic complex, but at the same time, even though that's how I view him personally, I don't think that he should be extradited to the US or should be if, have had all of this energy poured into trying to take him down for so long. It seems like just such a waste um, of the US time, the US government's time and their money and their resources when all he really did was leak exactly what the US government had done, which was I think this, the biggest thing was the bombing of those, um, the camera crew. I yeah. think it was like a drone strike on them, right? Where yeah. they, they, he leaked that and that was what they came after them for. And it's kind of like, well, pfft, you guys fucked up and you killed a whole bunch of innocent people in wherever it was, Iraq. So um, just because the way in which that was done was a little dodgy um, doesn't mean that you're not accountable for the fact that um, as far as I know, all the people involved in that haven't faced any kind of repercussions. So, yeah, it's just mind-blowing. But, yeah, I find Julian Assange insufferable, to be honest, whenever I hear him talk. I'm just like... Oh, dude, just I don't want to hear about this anymore. I'm over it. It's sort of my general. <laughs> I, I haven't seen too much of them, but yeah, general sort of vibe was was, was similar for me. Uh, but yeah, it was the first time I'd, I've voluntarily been to a protest. I, I went to actually like. I've, I've, <laughs> well, you've been forced to all the uh, others. <laughs> I, no, I accidentally walked into At a couple point. in um in <laughs> yeah uh, in Buenos Aires and Chile when I just went yeah. there. Like there was just. I don't know. They, they, they were just happening all the time. You, you, you kind of mm-hmm. couldn't avoid it. If you're in the city center, you're going to get just like walk it's, into one one day and be like, whoa. This is like um, Melbourne. Melbourne's the same and they always do the walk around like the the big um, streets in Melbourne. They'll be going up and down and screaming and shutting the trams down and everything. And you're kind of gotcha. like, oh, what is it today? <laughs> yeah. The, the one I went to in Buenos Aires, like the very first day I arrived, so within the first couple of hours, you know, put my stuff in and then just start started walking the streets and it was an it was kind of an artist uh, it was mm-hmm. or the 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 um, just the arts in general they were either getting defunded or they weren't getting yeah. enough funding or something like that and so it was just jugglers and break dancers and dancers yeah. and uh, you know just a general may- clowns mayhem on the streets it was it was kind of just a you know it was almost like a um a festival of some sort. So I was like, oh, okay, yeah. Well, I can <laughs> I, get I into find this. That that's, <laughs> I find though the the crowds in a lot of these kind of situations always, I, I find them interesting, right? Because you get to see who are the people who are passionate about this problem and how how similar or different am I to these people? Like I remember seeing on TV the, the anti-lockdown and anti-vaccine protests in Melbourne and you were just like, guys have a look around like (laughs) you guys all seem to have about three teeth amongst all of you and you're all swearing on camera and just going nuts are you sure that you're on the right side (laughs) like this and it's like just just descending into violence every other day you know there are fights with the police and people getting bashed and you're just like really (laughs) yeah it's it's tough because when you're there uh, and especially the media portrayal of it yeah it's it's going to be altered so you know Mm -hmm. perfect example here when we went there to the this Canberra one, there was maybe a hundred and I don't know, hundred people who came to it. And there was <laughs> me and my brother talked to this guy who was sort of like I call him a professional protester because he sounded like he was just at the <laughs> every the, protest. Well, at every protest mm-hmm. and at this the front lawn of the the Parliament House every day, mm-hmm. essentially. Mm-hmm. And his was a I don't know, he had so much stuff on his signs. There was uh something about like exposing pedophilia. There was something about um, chemtrails. There was something about long COVID. You know, there was, he had mm-hmm. like eight this different things going on. There's conspiracy theorists, people who are just hardcore into it. You take one of them and you go for all of them. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, chatting with him was bizarre. Uh, he definitely has a lot of fringe, <laughs> fringe, 
<laughs> well, you, you're unlikely to walk up to someone with that much shit on their sign and then be like a, you know, hey, how's it going, mate? Just down here, you know, just you know, just yeah, a normal dude yeah, it, just protesting the man and that fucking government and their pedophiles. He, he, no. Yeah, he, he, was, uh, he was able to switch topics very quickly. Uh, yeah. And, and you're sort of like, whoa! I was I was back in the conversation of four minutes ago, not 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 chemtrails, and yeah. uh, he he was sort of there, and he had some signs supporting Assange as well, but was kind of not meant to be too close. Like I I don't know what the actual rules were. Did the Assange people get out, you know, a straining order on him so he couldn't join their protest, sort of thing. Uh, mm. But it was definitely one of those ones where it's like, you know, if you wanted to, you could make this look really badly just by focusing on him and, and some of his friends True. and being like, Fair call. if you're into Assange, uh, like into the, um, you know, protecting his rights as a journalist and things like that, you are also by default <laughs> now into uh, protesting against chemtrails and all of these, you know, completely side issues. So... It, it was, is funny how they group together yeah. a lot of the time. You'll have one, like the, that was the case with COVID. I interviewed a guy on my podcast, I think it was Defunk, Debunk the Funk from YouTube, um, who was a microbiologist and he was, he used to be a conspiracy theorist um, with 9-11 when he was younger. Gotcha. Um, so, we were talking about that and he was just like, yeah, it's crazy how you'll end up going down one rabbit hole for a conspiracy theory that kind of gets you in the door and then you just start picking up all of the other ones because you're using the same way of thinking um, and rationalizing and, and, you know, sort of, what would you say, problem solving or um, sense making yeah. with, with all of them and you just start taking one after the other and it, it is, he was like, the way that I got out of it was by having conversations in the comments sections on YouTube videos with people and actually trying to be open and honest with them about my beliefs and having it questioned constantly. Yeah about why I believe certain things and how I came to that conclusion. And that's the biggest thing that irritates me about a lot of conspiracy theorists, if not all of them. Although there are certain conspiracies that turn out to be true. Yeah, well, yeah. Is that a lot of the time they base their um, their views on incredibly shaky evidence and that they don't separate the how badly do you want to believe these things from whether or not they're actually true. Yeah, like, you and, know, and it could be fun, people, you know. A lot of them are oh, 100%. just, you know, birds Birds aren't real. <laughs> Fucking hell, that is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I could get behind that just for the fun of it. You know, look at these fucking birds. Of course, they're CIA assets. And <laughs> I think there was someone getting interviewed about QAnon and believing that stuff. And they said that they, I think they um, didn't want to give up the community. And that was a big thing. And this yeah. is, you know, we can go deep into this, but there's the same thing with religion, right? Ultimately, they, 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 they suck you in through the community and then get you believing all of this stuff. And then you don't want to leave because all of your ties, your social ties are within the community. And so, you know, especially the really bad cults, um, you know, some of the craziest ones like Seventh-day Adventists and everything, it's like if you decide you don't want to follow exactly how we follow things now, you are completely ostracized. You will not see your children anymore. You will not see your family anymore. You will not see your friends anymore. You are out. You are gone. Well, that, that so one I can you... actually speak to because my dad was, um, he grew up Seventh-day Adventist. And, really? Um, yeah, yeah. So, there was, uh, so I think he left the church in his early 20s. Um, and it's not, f it's not full ostracization, you know. I, I, I've still seen, you know, cousins and uh, there's distance for sure, but it, it's mm -hmm. not it's not um, you know complete cutting off. Now, yeah. whether is that because it's kind of an unspoken agreement that they don't really talk about it, which is kind of the case. Um, you know, maybe that's so. If he was railing against it, you know, all the time, and you know, he he keeps his mouth shut when he goes and sees family. He doesn't <laughs> talk about uh, yeah. you know religion, I suppose, in, in that essence, but. Um, yeah, the more he tells me that there's, there's a lot of, I'm not sure, actually sure how much it has changed now. Cause he was saying when he went to, uh, there's a college called Avondale college in, I believe it's Newcastle there, they weren't allowed, um, piercings. They weren't allowed, uh, you know, jewelry of any kind and things like that. And we actually went there a couple of years ago and he saw some girls wearing like, I don't know, a short skirt and, and earrings and was like, whoa, <laughs> blasphemous. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, um, 
there's a lot of change there, but it, yeah, it wasn't too bad. Probably a better example would be, you know, the um, Heaven's Gate. Scientology. Uh, yeah, Heaven's Gate or Scientology yeah. or something like that, which is, yeah, uh, the, <laughs> there's levels to this game. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it, it is nuts. Yeah, generally for me, I, I just take the... Uh, uh, I'm not I'm not super big into conspiracies and while still acknowledging that there are a lot of bad uh you know bad stuff that is hidden behind the surface and stuff like that like I'll just I'll I'll take as general default some of them are true most of them aren't going to be and I just don't have time nor the care to <laughs> really find out you know maybe maybe chemtrails are true but you know what am I going to do about it sort of thing it's, it's kind of Kind yeah. of nihilistic in a way, but it's also I don't get pleasure from knowing all the bad stuff in the world, and I think a lot of these people do, and and yeah. that's why I just I, I just can't do it. Like it's uh, it's exhausting. Yeah, I don't know how the people like it's believing it is one thing, but I don't know how you get so motivated that you want to go and protest Parliament House about all of these things on behalf of someone you've never met. I, mm. I just. You know, it, it, Have a dad there are who's plenty of things that I'm passionate about. <laughs> for your flight down. Yeah. <laughs> I, know, I don't mean you, but the guy that was there with the sign and was just going nuts and seemed like a professional protester, someone like that, I'm kind of like, why are you doing this? Surely yeah. you've got other shit that you need to do. Don't you need to have a job or a family or hobbies or something? Like, why would you be... I think that um, was his job. ...choosing I've... to do this on a regular basis? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how he gets funding for that, but it from what it sounded like, it sounded like that was his main sort of gig that's that's what he does so uh yeah yeah where's the mo where's the money man where's it coming from <laughs> um but yeah in terms of protests as well uh have you been to any before I, after this one i just went uh it's sort of what i expected which is i all i could get out of it was i feel like i've kind of wasted my time here and if i really cared i would have been doing other things a bit what i feel would be more productive yeah, I don't think I've ever really been to one specifically uh, without just happening upon it. I think the only one I could really imagine going to, if the, and again, it would have to be kind of convenient for me. I'm not going to drive three hours or, you know, seven hours or whatever it was for you to get to Canberra in order to go to one because I was personally motivated to. But if there was something, say, like in Geelong here about climate change, I think I would probably consider going to that again assuming that it wasn't going to impinge upon my um my work or my family time or whatever because again it's it would have to be ranked against all of these other things yeah. that are obviously important but um climate change is one where i can see it being useful just in terms of the numbers of people showing up to um indicate that this is a serious problem whereas I mean, I guess that's the case with all protests to some degree, but like with Julian Assange, I don't really get how doing that in Australia is going to change anything when it's not really in our hands at all. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he's, yeah, a, like he's in England. <laughs> yeah, England yeah, going to Australia. Like, yeah, yeah, it's like protesting against poverty or something. You're kind of like, well, what is this achieving by you coming out and saying I'm against poverty? We're all against poverty. What are you like? Where? What specifically here in Australia? What like go give someone money then? I don't know. So I feel like there are better ways of spending your time and energy. Um, and yeah, if I was someone who was that passionate about issues, I would probably be finding the one that I could make the biggest difference in nearby. Right. So if it was say corruption of some kind, it would be how do I bring this down to a local level so that I can actually really go out and do something. You know, even if it's just giving money to a journalist who's covering a certain... Like with Julian Assange, it would be if I was that passionate about it, I'd probably just be giving money to his legal fees, you know, or or um, donating money to WikiLeaks or something as opposed to wasting my time and energy going to a protest in Canberra. It would be how do I, how do I take the resources that I have and make the biggest change that I'm capable of making and that's probably not by holding up a sign in front of Parliament House. It would be by donating my time or money somewhere else. Um, you know, usefully. Yeah, maybe that's what I did wrong. I didn't have a sign, so. <laughs> <laughs> you should have made one. Maybe you should have just held it while tight to your leg whilst doing a handstand down there in front of the place and yeah, they noticed you. Get, that's how you get attention, man. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, all this training finally paid off. Yes, and then someone yes, comes exactly. Out and like, this is you know what? This one Fuck moment. it. We're letting Julian Assange go. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the effort. Look at the effort. Oh, also, and that was that was really fun, Pete. Um, I think I'll we'll just call it here for today. It's been going, geez, about two hours now. So 
Yeah, sounds Pretty good, man. Time. Thank you for hanging out. And um, yeah, man. Um, up in my if, if people want to learn more about Aussie English and uh, and your new plant channel and and things like that, where's the uh, best place for them to go? Uh, well, just type in Aussie English podcast on Google or in YouTube, and you'll find me. And then Pete versus plants <laughs> is my uh, plant channel on on YouTube. If I, if I suddenly have more than twenty subscribers, I'll know that this has reached quite a few people. <laughs> Have you? Uh, I was actually looking in your associated channels, and I don't think I saw anything else because I thought you had another Aussie Clips channel or something like that. Once upon a time, I could be wrong about that. Yeah, I just never got around. I never got around to linking them. I don't think I just have an Aussie English TV channel where I put up the interviews. So that's, that's where all it. those tend to be. But um, okay, yeah, I need to subscribe with the plant to that. channel. I haven't. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. with the plant channel, it's been interesting because I haven't mentioned it to anyone uh, from Aussie English. I haven't talked about it on Aussie English besides oh, okay. saying that I'm doing one. I'm trying, I'm trying to grow it from scratch again just to remember what it's actually like to have, um, you know, a, a very small following and appreciate that. And I found that the other day. It was really funny. I, I caught myself checking my stats on the Pete versus Plants channel and being like, holy shit, I got 25 subscribers. Fuck yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. I got over five subscribers over the last <laughs> two days. And I, it's sort of cute. Like I see myself saying that as someone who has another channel that's getting close to 200,000 subscribers and I don't, it just becomes numbers at that point. You don't really sit there and you're like, wow, I got another 300 subscribers today or it just doesn't really factor in because it's just consistently happening. But it was um, kind of cute and fun to start a new channel and, and see that people are giving me their time and subscribing to the channel and everything when I've only got a few videos up and I'm a total noob when it comes to to anything plants. So, yeah, I don't know. I found that worth mentioning that it is really funny when you get a reality check like that. And I've tried to not publicize the, uh, the plant channel on the podcast one because I know I would just end up with a shitload of people coming over interested in being like, what the fuck is this Aussie English guy doing with plants and then bailing and it just yeah, sort of, you know, throwing sure. the algorithm off or whatever. But this way I kind of get a core um, community again of just people interested in this who don't know me through Aussie English. And also I get a sort of reality check to hopefully appreciate what it's actually taken to grow Aussie English to what it's grown to because I think I've kind of forgotten how, how much of a grind that was over the last seven or eight years. For sure, for sure. Awesome, man. Thanks for your time and um, yeah, we'll do it again soon.